I would like to begin this program with two quotations from the New Testament, the book of John. I'd like you to keep them in mind as you listen to this entire program, because they really are reflective of all of the messages that are in these nine principles. The first is from John 10, verse 34. Is it not written in your law, I have said, you are God's? And then from John 14, verse 20, On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. You have the power within you to attract to yourself all that you could ever want. This is the central theme of Manifest Your Destiny, which is unlike any book or program that I have ever previously produced. I have chosen to write and talk about manifesting because I have been drawn to it, rather than because it is the next logical step in the progression of books and programs that I have produced over the past two decades. As I began writing, I felt a kind of humility, along with a feeling of arrogance. These feelings created questions such as, who am I to write about this capacity to manifest? Isn't this territory reserved for divine beings? What gives me the authority to tell others about an ability that is unique to the gods? These questions swirled around inside of me, and I was motivated by more self-doubt than I like to acknowledge. And then I did what I have encouraged my readers to do in my most recent book, Your Sacred Self. I banished all my doubts, and I began listening to the inner voices that kept telling me I would receive the guidance I needed, and that I would not be alone in this project. In other words, I surrendered and went deep within in my meditations, and allowed myself to release all fear and doubt, and simply to trust. It was at this time, as I was considering writing these principles and producing this program, even though I had no clear idea what they were precisely, nor in what order they should be presented, that I received a message from a teacher named Guruji to whom this book is dedicated. Sri Guruji instructed me to listen to a tape on the power of manifesting and to practice in my own life what I was being taught and then to present this manifesting technique to the world. I began to practice the manifestation principles in my daily meditations just as they are presented in this book and in this program. I experienced astonishing results almost immediately. A few months later I produced a compact disc and a cassette tape titled Meditations for Manifesting and thousands of people began to use these principles and practice the manifesting meditation techniques. The results have been mind-shattering. I have heard stories of manifesting job promotions, having a baby, which was supposedly an impossibility, selling a home that had been on the market for years without potential buyers, and other stories of prosperity and healing that border on being miracles. I know that these principles work. Their miraculous power is not based on a belief, it is a knowing. I know that we have a divine power that has gone untapped primarily because of our conditioning. I know that you can begin to manifest for yourself virtually anything that you're capable of conceiving if you practice these nine principles studiously. Make an effort to listen to these principles and begin to apply them in your daily life without judging them based on what you have been conditioned to believe about yourself as a person who is, quote, only human, unquote, and therefore limited. What you desire is of central importance though you may never before have even thought of desire and higher spiritual awareness as compatible concepts. Yet the process of creating begins first with a desire. Your desires, cultivated as seeds of potential on the path of spiritual awareness, can blossom in the form of the freedom to have these desires in peace and harmony with your world. Giving yourself permission to explore this path is allowing yourself the freedom to use your mind to create the precise material world that matches your inner world. That inner world is the catalyst for determining your physical world experiences. You will have to abandon the idea that you are powerless over the circumstances of your life. You will need to shift out of the group mentality that says you are incapable of manifesting. Examine the pressures and beliefs which reflect the thinking of your immediate family, your extended family, your community, your religious groupings, your ethnic grouping, your educational business groupings, or any of a multitude of specialized units of people. Determine the areas of your life that are jammed up with the teachings of those mindsets, causing your personal evolution to be slowed down because what you truly desire or believe is not getting any energy from your unique individuality. As you unplug your circuits from those external forces, you will see the speed of your evolvement increase drastically. If you hear a voice behind your eyeballs that says, move forward, you no longer wait for everyone else to make a move forward before you take your first step. When you cultivate the inner conviction to manifest from the world of the unseen into the material world, you understand that there is a universal God force that is in all things in the universe. 
There's not a separate God for each individual, each plant, each animal, each mineral. They are all one. The same God force that is within you and causes you to think and breathe is simultaneously in everyone and everything else as well. There is no place that it is not. Consequently, that which you perceive to be missing from your life also contains the same God force or universal intelligence that is within you. Manifesting then becomes doing nothing more than bringing into form a new aspect of yourself. You are not creating something from nothing. You are learning to align yourself with an aspect of your being that your senses have not known they could activate. You and that which you want to manifest into your life are one. As I wrote this book, I had the most peaceful experience of writing that I've ever enjoyed. What you are listening to right now is the result of these nine principles. The key word I kept in mind as I wrote and allowed these principles to manifest through me was the word tight. That means to me, no extraneous verbiage, no case studies, and a minimum of quotations. Each principle is explained in as straightforward a manner as I know how. Each came directly from my heart and not from my head. When I felt I had said what was needed to be said and when I had provided specific suggestions for implementing the principles, I simply stopped. You are listening to the tightest handbook I know how to devise to teach the fundamental principles for spiritual manifestation. My internal knowing is that when you practice these nine principles, you will be given guidance. You will not be alone on this journey, and you will see your desires manifest as your destiny in your daily life. Finally, you will know that your job is to say yes rather than how. I'm sending you all green lights. The first principle is called Becoming Aware of Your Highest Self. Within you is a divine capacity to manifest and attract all that you need or desire. This is such a powerful statement that I suggest you listen to it over and over again and savor it before you begin this journey. Remember, within you is a divine capacity to manifest and attract all that you need or desire. Most of what we are taught to believe about our reality conflicts with this statement. I have a divine ability to manifest and attract what I need or desire. Becoming aware of your highest self does not happen through physical effort, nor can one rely solely upon supernatural techniques. What is essential is that you learn that you are both a physical body in a material world and a non-physical being who can gain access to a higher level. That higher level is within you and is reached through the stages of adult development. I present these stages with some degree of expertise because I've spent many years in each of them. They have been stepping stones to my awareness of my higher self. Each stage involved experiences that permitted me to move ahead in my thinking and my awareness. There are four stages of adult development. The first is called the athlete. The word athlete is intended as a description of the time in our adult lives when our primary identification is with our physical body and how it functions in our everyday world. This is the time when life seems impossible without a mirror and a steady stream of approval to make us feel secure. The stage of the athlete is the time in our adult development when we are almost completely identified with our performance, attractiveness, and achievements. Obviously, it is healthy to take good care of your body by treating it kindly and exercising and nourishing it in the best way your circumstances allow. Having pride in your physical appearance and enjoying compliments does not mean you are body fixated. However, if your daily activities revolve around a predetermined standard of performance and appearance, you are in the stage that I am calling here the athlete. The second stage is identified by the word the warrior. When we leave the athlete stage behind, we generally enter the stage of the warrior. This is the time when the ego dominates our lives and we feel compelled to conquer the world to demonstrate our superiority. My definition of ego is the idea that we have of ourselves as important and separate from everyone else. The ego-driven warrior objective is to subdue and defeat others in a race for the number one spot. During this stage, we are busy with goals and achievements and competition with others. This ego-dominated stage is full of anxiety and endless comparison of our successes. Trophies, awards, titles, and the accumulation of material objects record our achievements. The warrior is intensely concerned with the future and who might be in his way or interfere with his status. The third stage is identified by the term the statesperson. The statesperson stage of life is the time when we have tamed our ego and shifted our awareness. 
In this stage, we want to know what is important to the other person. We've begun to know that our primary purpose is to give rather than to get. The state's person is still an achiever and quite often athletic. However, the inner drive is to serve others. Authentic freedom cannot be experienced until one learns to tame the ego and move out of self-absorption. When you can let go of your own thoughts about yourself and not think of you for a long period of time, that is when you become free. The statesperson stage of adulthood is about service and gratefulness for all that shows up in your life. At this level, you're very close to your highest self. The primary force in your life is no longer the desire to be the most powerful and attractive or to dominate and conquer. You have entered the realm of inner peace. It is always in the service of others, regardless of what you do or what your interests are, that you find the bliss you're seeking. There is one stage even higher than the statesperson, and this can be described by the word the spirit. When you enter this highest stage of life, regardless of your age or position, you recognize your truest essence, the highest self. When you know your highest self, you're on the way to becoming a co-creator of your entire world, learning to manage the circumstances of your life and participating with assurance in the act of creation. You become literally a manifester. The spirit stage of life is characterized by an awareness that this place called Earth is not your home. You know that you're not an athlete, a warrior, or even a statesperson, but that you are an infinite, limitless, immortal, universal, and eternal energy temporarily residing in a body. You know that nothing dies and that everything is an energy that is constantly changing. This inner infinite energy is not just in you, it is in all things and all people who are alive now and have ever lived. You begin to know this intimately. When you reach this level, you're in the space I think of as being in this world, but not of this world. Most people think of the spiritual world as a future occurrence that they will know after death. Most of us have been taught that the highest self is something that you cannot know as long as you're trapped in a body. However, the spirit is now. It is in you in this moment, and the energy is not something that you will ultimately come to know, but is what you are here and now. The unseen energy that was once in Shakespeare or Picasso or Galileo or any human form, is also available to all of us. That is because the spirit energy does not die, it simply changes form. It can't die because it has no boundaries, no beginnings, no ends, no physical characteristic that we call form. That energy is within you. Gaining the awareness that you have a higher self that is universal and eternal will lead you to gaining access to the world more freely and to participating in the act of creation or manifesting your heart's desire. There is something called the seen and the unseen. Consider for a moment the world of form that you see around you, including your body. Who is that invisible eye inside all of the tubes and bones and arteries and skin that are your physical form? To know yourself authentically, you must understand that everything that you notice around you was and is caused by something in the world of the unseen. That something is the world of the spirit. When you look at a giant oak tree, ask yourself what caused that tree to become what it is. It started from a tiny acorn. Your logical, rational mind says that there must be something resembling treeness within that acorn. But when you open the acorn, you find nothing resembling a tree. All you find is a mass of brown stuff. If you further examine the brown stuff, you will discover distinctly acornish molecules, then atoms and electrons, then subatomic particles, until finally you find that there are no particles only waves of energy that mysteriously come and go. Your conclusion will be that the acorn and the tree itself have a creator that is unseen, immeasurable, and called by those of us who need to classify such things the spirit or soul. This unseen world that is the source of the world of the seen is also the cause of you. In the beginning is energy, energy that has no dimensions, energy that is not in the visible world. This is our original self. It is potentiality, not an object, a future pull, if you will. It is this world of the unseen that I would like you to consider as you listen to these words. Look around you now at the world of form. Then look within and realize that the world began in the unseen dimension. Then make the big leap to the awareness that you are both of these worlds simultaneously. You are not separate from the world of the unseen any more than you could be separate from the world of the seen. You are a combination of both at all moments of your life. The problem that faces most of us in becoming manifestors and learning to manage the circumstances of our lives 
is that we have forfeited our ability to oscillate between the world of form and that unseen world. Have you been taught that the Creator is something outside yourself? If so, your inner world, the world of the unseen, is full of notions that prohibit you from participating in the creative process. When you overcome these notions, your unseen self will be your ticket to creation in your life. What you want to practice here really is transcending your conditioning. Whether you like it or not, all of us have been conditioned to think and act in ways that have become automatic. We need to figure out how to get past this conditioning if we want to gain access to our highest self. You can be sure the ego will not take well to this kind of an effort. Asking the ego to help diminish its own significance so that you might have access to your higher self is akin to attempting to stand on your own shoulders. Ego is as unable to move aside in deference to spirit as is your eye able to see itself, or the tip of your tongue able to touch the tip of your tongue. Your task thus becomes a quagmire of paradoxes. If you rely upon your ego to get past the influences of the ego, it will only strengthen its hold on you. You must figure out how to emancipate consciousness from the limitations of your mind and your body. In the ego state, you generally experience yourself as a separate entity. To move past this conditioning, you want to begin to see yourself as humanity rather than as a separate form in a body. Very simply put, if you feel that you are disconnected from the rest of humanity and truly a separate entity needing to prove yourself and compete with others, you will be unable to manifest your heart's desire. If you are able to see yourself as a part of what you desire, you will have transcended the conditioning of your ego and of all the other egos who have contributed to this process in your life. Here are a few of the conditioned thoughts that keep your ego in charge of your life and prevent you from materializing what you desire and what desires you. The first is called, I am not in charge of my life. That force is outside me. <laughs> you can change this perception. Turn your attention away from the ego-dominated thoughts about the circumstances of your life to the present moment. By consciously noticing your breath, the sounds, textures, smells, and scenes that the life force is experiencing through you. A second conditioned thought says, people cannot manifest. It is all a function of the cosmic throw of the dice. It's all just luck. Well, blaming luck or some external invisible force that controls the universe is a habit of conditioning that leads to disempowerment and ultimately to defeat. You are the universe. It is not something outside you. You are that force which is in everything, even the things that have previously failed to show up in your life. Remember, as you think, so shall you be. If you think you can't, you're right. And that is precisely what you will see showing up in your life. A third conditioned response or thought. I have tried before and it's never worked for me. Here the conditioned response is believing that once having tried and failed, further efforts will yield the same results. Let go of your obsession with the past and with trying, and instead remain relaxed and casual in the moment. Your past is an illusion. It is the trail that is left behind you, and a trail behind you cannot drive you today, regardless of what you choose to believe. All you have is now, and you have never tried anything. A fourth conditioned thought. Only highly evolved beings can manifest. Here again, this is the ego saying that you are separate and distinct from your spiritual teachers and others who live at the highest levels. Relinquish those thoughts and replace them with seeing yourself as connected to everyone by that unseen life force that is your divine essence. The first spiritual principle directs you to overcome your conditioning. It requires you to adopt a new attitude about yourself and then to put this attitude into daily practice. I am encouraging you to know the highest self rather than read about it, to know it in the deepest reaches of your being, and then to never doubt it again. I encourage you to follow these suggestions for developing the first principle as a permanent part of your total awareness. The first suggestion. Think of this definition of enlightenment. To be immersed in and surrounded by peace. Your highest self only wants you to be at peace. It does not judge, it doesn't compare or demand that you defeat anyone or be better than anyone. You know your highest self by listening to the voice that only wants you to be at peace. That's what enlightenment is. A second suggestion. Go beyond the restrictions of the physical plane. The purpose of the highest self is to assist you in this effort. You do this by creating an inner sanctuary that is yours and yours alone. 
Go to the silent inner retreat as often as you can and let go of all attachments to the external world of the ego. As you go to this sanctuary, a light will be born within you that you will come to know and respect. This light is your connection to the energy of manifestation. Here's a third suggestion. Refuse to defend yourself to anyone or anything on the earth plane. This is the challenge of the highest self. Use your inner light for your alignment and allow those who disagree with that perspective to have their own points of view. You are at peace. You never explain and you refuse to flaunt your energy. You know and that is enough for you. And here's a fourth and final suggestion. Surrender and trust in the wisdom that created you. This trust is your corner of freedom and it will always be yours. Your highest self is not just an idea that sounds lofty and spiritual. It is a way of being. It is the very first principle that you must come to understand and embrace as you move toward attracting to you that which you want and need for this parentheses in eternity that you know as your life. The second principle is called trusting yourself, is trusting the wisdom that created you. Learning to trust may be difficult in the beginning. It will be an exercise in futility if you rely upon your mind to create trust. The mind attempts to come up with intellectual answers by using proofs, logic, and theoretical reasoning. In contrast, the method of the heart, focused on spiritual understanding, is an intuitive recognition of the value of love. The heart trusts the inner wisdom that it feels and spontaneously knows, whereas the mind demands scientific evidence before it will trust. When the mind seeks corroboration through specific proofs as an aid to spiritual understanding, it is encroaching into an area far more suited to the heart. For this reason, it is necessary to trust what the heart knows. Without total trust, it is impossible to know the miracles of the higher self and become a manifester. This means cultivating a harmony between mind and heart, and for most of us this means terminating the intellect's domination. It is with this surrendering process that trust begins to flourish, replacing doubt. Here are two theories describing our place in nature. I think you will agree that the first theory illuminates why mistrust of ourselves and our divine abilities is so deeply rooted. The first theory is called nature as a mechanism. In this mechanistic view of nature, everything is an artifact made by a boss who has many different names. In the Western view, the boss is called God. This God is often depicted as a white-bearded male who roams around the sky creating the natural world. The world is a construct and God the constructor. This biblical God is paternal, authoritarian, beneficent, and, in many ways, tyrannical. He keeps track of all things and knows precisely what everyone does and when his laws are being broken. One of the operatives of this theory of nature is the idea of punishment for one's sins. This God, dash father, or Godfather, holds us accountable for transgressions. All subjects are considered born with a stain of sin as a part of their nature and are therefore untrustworthy. This makes many people feel estranged. Once convinced that you are untrustworthy and basically a sinner, you're quite lost. You cannot even maintain trust in God because of the basic mistrust of yourself, and not trusting in that God may be breaking one of his own laws. It's a no-win situation. This theory of nature is absolutely incompatible with the second principle of manifesting. You cannot tune into the power and energy of the universe to create and attract an abundant life if that energy and power is outside of yourself. There's a second theory of nature that I call nature as spontaneous and non-judging. In this spontaneous view, God is universal intelligence flowing through everything. Nature is an unforced unfolding of life forms and there is no boss. Rather than learning to manage and control the natural world, the impulse is to trust it. Human beings are an aspect of this God and are therefore carriers of divinity. Generally, in this theory, human beings are considered the highest level of life form. Trusting this most evolved natural human includes trusting the paradox of behavior described as good and bad, selfish and unselfish, or greedy and generous, in the same manner as we respect other life forms by trusting their processes. This second principle directs us to develop an inner knowing so that the natural process of what desires us is what we desire. Think of yourself as a consciousness being played out by God, just as a wave is a part of the ocean that is being played out by the ocean itself. 
The unseen divine energy is the ocean that your wave form is a part of. You can call it God, ocean, or anything else. This is a profoundly exquisite realization because with it, you bring to your consciousness the inner awareness that you are actually in all things. This leads to miraculous manifestations. You begin to consider what it means to be in all things at one time. Authentic trust is only available through the knowing heart. When you enter this trusting space, everything will come to you that belongs to you because you've created the inner capacity to receive it. The irony is that what you wish to receive is a part of you. This can be a troublesome concept to grasp because of the ego's attachment to being separate and special. Nothing in your rational mind could convince you that water is made of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. It appears to be a fluid that flows and has nothing to do with gases. But when we subject water to scrutiny, its constituent elements become manifest. And so it is with the idea of being in all things at once. If you truly trust in this notion, you realize that everything that you perceive as missing in your life is a part of the same energy that you are. Manifesting becomes the art of bringing to yourself that which is already you. I have deliberately chosen not to use many quotations in this program. But I want to emphasize that every spiritual master and all of the saints and teachers and gurus or priests throughout history have espoused similar advice. This perennial philosophy connects all humanity from tribal and ancient to civilized and present times. It is the message that God is within and outside every living thing and that there is a world we are a part of that is not subject to the changing world of time and space that we presently are a part of. Since it is everywhere, it is not only within you, it is you. The meaning of this is that God is not to be found so much as discovered within yourself. The statement, Thou art the path, is more than an ecclesiastical admonition. It is a statement of your reality. And then you must consider prayer and what it means to understand this concept of trust. In the matter of prayer, it seems that we often view God as a gigantic vending machine in the sky who's going to grant us our wishes when we put in the proper tokens in the form of prayers. We expect to insert prayers, then pull on the knob and hope that God will dispense the goodies. The God vending machine becomes the object of our veneration. We tell the machine how good it is and how much we worship it and expect it to be good to us in return. The basic premise here is that God is outside us and therefore what we need and want is also outside of us. If we believe that we are separate from God, the vending machine approach to prayer reinforces and deepens that belief. I prefer to promote the idea of prayer in its essence as a communion with God. What we seek in prayer is the experience of coexisting with God. Prayer is our communication of readiness for the desires of this sacred energy to manifest through our human form. Therefore, the true experience of God does not change or alter God, but it changes us. It heals our sense of separation. If we are not changed by prayer, we have denied ourselves the opportunity to know the wisdom that created us. The search for happiness outside ourselves rekindles the idea that we are not whole and relegates prayer to the status of a plea to a boss God. We are then asking for favors rather than seeking a manifestation of our invisible inspired self. Prayer at the spiritual level I'm talking about is not asking for something any more than the attempt to become a manifestor is asking for something to show up in your life. What I call authentic prayer is inviting divine desire to express itself through myself. It expresses my experience of oneness with the divine energy. This may sound like a radical or even blasphemous notion, but is the source of all spiritual traditions. Here's a few examples. In Christianity, they say, the kingdom of heaven is within you. In Islam, they say, those who know themselves know their God. In Buddhism, they say, look within, you are the Buddha. In Vedanta, they say, Atman, or individual consciousness, and Brahman, universal consciousness, are one. Yoga says, God dwells within you, as you. Confucianism, heaven, earth, and human are of one body. And in the Upanishads, the ancient texts of the Hindus, by understanding the self, all this universe is known. 
Overcoming your conditioning in this area is crucially important. Replace thoughts about your experiences with the experience of prayer. For instance, praying in this sense can be a sentence such as, Sacredness, guide me now, or sacred love, flow through me now, silently reciting instead of thinking thoughts. Prayer in this form is tilling and clearing the inner self of ego chatter, so that what you desire and what desires you can grow. My own personal practice of prayer is participating in a communion with God, wherein I see God within me and ask for the strength and the inner awareness to handle whatever confronts me. I keep reminding myself that heaven on earth is a choice I must make, not a place I must find. Trust, then, is the cornerstone of my praying, and with it comes the peace that is the essence of manifesting. And this idea of peace really becomes the result of this trust. You may recall that earlier I defined enlightenment as being immersed in and surrounded by peace. The more you trust in the wisdom that creates all, the more you will be trusting in yourself. The result of trusting is that an enormous sense of peace becomes available to you. As this awareness grows, you will discover that you are a more peaceful person, and consequently that enlightenment becomes the way of your life. Being independent of the good opinion of others and being detached from the need to be right are two powerful indicators that your life is shifting toward a consciousness of trust in yourself and trust in God. Yet there are many people in our lives who disturb our state of peacefulness. The people whom we agree with and share similar interests with us are easy to accept and actually teach us very little. But those who can push our buttons and send us into a rage at the slightest provocation are our real teachers. Disguised as manipulative, inconsiderate, frustrating, non-understanding beings. The peace that is enlightenment means that you are not only at peace with those who share your interests and agree with you, and with strangers who come and go, but also with those master teachers who remind you that you still have some work to do on yourself. Peace occurs when your highest self is dominant in your life. When you begin to feel peace as the result of trust, you are enjoying a healthy soul. There are many things that you can do on a regular basis to make this second principle of trusting in the oneness a reality in your life. Here are a few suggestions to nurture trust in yourself and in that oneness. The first is called, begin by admitting your confusion or failures. When you're honest with yourself about every aspect of your life, you discontinue identifying with separateness. You then become ready for the insight that trust in yourself and trust in ultimate truth are one and the same. A second suggestion is to keep in mind that you cannot go to a higher ground if you're hanging on to a lower level. You cannot leave the physical world if you're so attached to it that you refuse to let go. The concept of trust involves surrendering to and trusting the God force. The third suggestion is to acquire a rebellious attitude toward the philosophy that preaches a style of God as boss who is authoritarian and a benevolent tyrant. Rejection of this model does not mean that you are an atheist, but rather a believer in the true meaning of divinity. A fourth suggestion is to remember that trusting does not mean you never experience life's valleys. There will be peaks and valleys as long as you live in this physical plane. Do not abandon trust when your ego thinks things should be different than they are. It is better to embrace trust when darkness is present, knowing that light will follow. Begin to look for the lesson in the darkness, rather than cursing it. And a fifth suggestion is to take your serious problems and turn them over to God. Say something like the following. I've not been able to resolve these issues in my life. I would like to show my trust in the divine force by simply turning them over to your divine hands, which I know are also mine, and I trust that this action will lead to a resolution of these problems. A sixth suggestion is to remember that the presence of complete trust is evident in your life when what you think and feel and do are all balanced and in harmony. To say, I believe in a healthy body, and to practice eating in unhealthy ways dissolves trust in yourself. When you are incongruent with your thoughts, you are showing a lack of trust in the divinity that is your essence. And finally, a seventh suggestion, begin a meditation practice of contemplating the supreme principle that is beyond the pettiness of this world. Meditation is not merely making the mind think that it is meditating. Meditation is literally the embodiment of truth and trust. It is knowing that I can confront myself in a spirit of serenity and that what I seek will be attracted to me. This, then, is the energy of manifesting, and it comes most frequently when the mind is quiet. 
It is the quiet mind that comes in contact with the truth. This process of closing my eyes and becoming serene gives me the ability to tap into that source of inspiration. Inspiration. The very word comes from in spirit. This second principle of manifesting leads us to a higher place within ourself. You will be a silent sage, moving through this material plane, knowing that you have tapped into a source of inspiration that provides you with all the sustenance you need. Indeed, you will begin to see how this earth plane is really a very big part of you, more so than you might ever have imagined. And this then becomes the subject for the third principle of manifesting. The third principle of manifesting is called, you are not an organism in an environment, you are an environment organism. One of the reasons the idea of being able to manifest is so foreign to most of us is because we have been brought up to believe that as individuals we are separate from our environment. We think it is our role to dominate it. Armed with this kind of logic, we are diminished in our ability to sense our connection to the environment. This third principle of manifesting begins with the understanding that it is absolutely impossible to describe ourselves as separate from our environment. I am coining a new word for the purpose of articulating this principle. Consider yourself an environ organism. This word signifies that there is absolutely no difference between you and your environment. You are your environment, and even more significantly for the purposes of this tape, your environment is you. Think about your own nature as an environment organism. Try thinking of the external world, your environment, as your extended body. That is, you are not separate from the external world. In this concept, it is impossible to describe yourself without including your surroundings. In fact, it is not even possible to see or hear yourself as a separate entity apart from your environment. For example, describe yourself walking, just you walking. There cannot be walking without also describing what it is you are walking upon. Without the floor or the ground, there would only be your legs moving back and forth, and of course that's not walking. Your experience of walking also includes the air you are breathing, the gravity that keeps you from floating off into space, the pebbles or carpet or sand or cement that you walk upon. And I invite you to shift your awareness away from yourself as an organism in the environment to yourself as an extension of your environment and always inseparable from it. This means that you have to think of yourself as an individual and as an environment simultaneously. Have you ever seen a person with a front but without a back? Have you ever seen a person with an outside but without an inside? Well, these rhetorical questions are meant to stimulate you to consider how you can be differentiated and undifferentiated at the same time and why this is important in learning to manifest your life as you choose. The nature of the physical world is essentially that of waves. Each wave of energy that makes up a physical mass has a crest or a peak and a nadir or a valley. These tops and bottoms of the waves are always easy to identify as separate, yet they are always together. You can never ever get a bucket full of peaks and observe them independent of their corresponding valleys. This is the fundamental feature of nature. Your front always has a back, your inside always has an outside. And now you must extend this understanding outward as well. You are distinct, just like the tops of the waves that make up your natural physical self, but you are irrevocably connected to the outer world, just as that bottom of the wave always has a top. When you begin to see this simple truth, mystical experiences of manifesting also open up to you as a genuine possibility. You see, you're either pushing nature around, or you're seeing it as yourself, one or the other. When we think of ourselves as distinct from our environment, we take on a posture of exercising control over it. We destroy forests and swamps and mountains and rivers and wildlife or anything else that obstructs profit and convenience over something we call advancing civilization. We defend these activities without understanding that we are also destroying ourselves. As we have seen, we cannot be described independent of our environment any more than our outside can be described without our inside. When we can respect that which appears to be external to us, we will build to live in harmony with, rather than in control over, our environment. 
In our personal lives, recognizing nature as ourselves opens up an entirely new world of manifestation. Your new faith will no longer permit you to see anything as separate. The separateness will always be there, just as the peak of the wave is separate from the trough. But they remain inseparable, even while separate. You will have fused the dichotomy that prevents you from putting this connective energy to work. You will begin to view yourself as an organic part of this world, rather than as a separate entity in this world. And then you'll see yourself as an organic part of this world. There's a popular belief that we come into this world. <laughs> Thus we are continuously embracing the idea that who we are and where we come from are two different worlds. The essence of the third spiritual principle for manifesting your destiny is that there is no separation, and rather than coming into this world as a construction project, you actually grow out of it. You are a result of what the universe is doing on a conscious level, just as a wave is what the ocean is doing, and a plum is what the plum tree is doing. The intelligence that is you, unseen as it may be, is you in every stage of your creation and life experience, and it is also the same in every other person, as well as in all things in our physical world. Notice that everyone breathes the same air, walks on the same ground, and thinks as an organism just like you. You are indeed connected to all of these beings. It is not an accident that someone living in a distant country with different outward physical characteristics and a separate language could die and donate their liver or kidney or cornea to you, and it would accommodate the life force flowing in you. A profoundly important Native American saying is, No tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Imagine the result of such behavior by the tree. The tree and all of its parts would die from such an absurdity. Yet that is precisely what we do when we see ourselves as divided from all of the other people who are being peopled from the same divine intelligence. When you know that you grow out of this world just as an apple does from an apple tree, then you identify with the spiritual essence. It is in identification with this inner essence that you make your connection to everything else. And it is with this connection that you begin to attract your desires to your physical world. I want you to gain a clear sense of how you are actually growing out of this world. You are not a momentary flash of embodied consciousness between two eternal blacknesses. You are an essence that is eternally growing in this world. A world in which the spirit and the manifestation of that spirit appear to be different to the senses, and indeed they are, but they are also connected. This awareness is crucial as you proceed along the manifesting path. That power is in you, but it's not yours alone. The power and the magic of this world cannot be reserved for the exclusive use of anyone, including you. It is available at all times. However, it does not belong to anyone. What you are doing as an environ organism is making contact with an energy that is beyond the dualism of the earth plane, and yet is connected to it at the same time, separate but distinct. You are a holistic being with both non-dualistic energy and the energy of the physical plane at your disposal. As a holistic being, you shatter the illusion of your separateness and reveal your connection to everything. This empowers you in a way that the ego-driven self could never contemplate. One of the ways to understand this is to see yourself as a hologram. A hologram is a three-dimensional photographic image obtained with laser beams. The unique thing about a hologram is that one small segment contains the entire picture. When one tiny piece of the hologram is broken off and projected, it shows an image of the entire object. The hologram is a perfect representation for you as an environ organism. Your environment includes everyone alive and dead and you can draw their energy to you because, from a hologrammatic viewpoint, they are you. You are one little physical image that reflects all of humanity when projected spiritually upon the cosmic screen. Each and every one of us is the whole of humanity. You cannot escape this conclusion. Human beings are the same everywhere. We share the emotions of fear, love, hate, and jealousy. We also share our life-giving blood, intermingling it with the survival of those who need it, and we have the same internal organs and thoughts. When you perceive yourself in the hologram that is humanity, you connect on an energy level to everyone else in your environment. An environ organism most truly is a reflection of it all, and this energy that you share is shared by all. This awareness gives you the option to tap into this universal energy anywhere, at any time, 
by metaphorically projecting yourself to reflect the whole. When you can do this without doubt or reservation, you can literally see how your inner thoughts and desires are not only within you, but are within the whole of humanity, which is abundantly boundless. As an environment organism, you are a single individual who is only a part of the picture at the same time that you contain the whole panorama. Moreover, the content of your consciousness is also hologrammatic in nature. Consciousness is the mental condition of being aware. The power of your thoughts in this hologrammatic view can be projected in such a way as to connect to all of humanity. Your thoughts are literally connected to the thoughts of everyone else, as are your emotions, your desires, your total inner world. You can learn to use this connection to nurture your own divinity, and therefore, by definition, the divinity of all of humanity. The nature of a hologram and the nature of you as an environment organism are one and the same. The Bhagavad Gita, the holy book of the Hindus, summarizes the point of view as profoundly as I've ever heard. Listen to these words. He who sees that the Lord of all is ever the same in all that is, immortal in the field of mortality, he sees the truth. And when a man sees that the God in himself is the same God in all that is, he hurts not himself by hurting others. Then he goes, indeed, to the highest path. The key phrase in this profound passage is, In all that is. This includes you and me and everything that is. It is you. You are not separate from it. Here are a few suggestions for beginning to implement this principle, this third principle of manifesting, which says that you are not separate from your environment. First, make a conscious effort to check yourself when you begin to think in ways that reflect separateness. Imagine yourself as a part of all that you see and make an internal attempt to project the energy of your thoughts into all that is alive on the planet. This inner practice will help you to embrace the concept of you as an environment organism rather than an organism in an environment. Secondly, contemplate the energy that is your life force. Forget about your body and your thoughts and focus attention on your energy, which is also known as chi or prana. See if you can sense it objectively and also try to do the same thing with the energy of someone close to you. Watch that person and forget about their body. Center your attention on the idea that you share the same energy and so you are the same person at that energy level. Thirdly, trust in the wisdom of your feelings. If you feel it, it is true for you. When you trust your feelings, you trust the energy that is the life force of the universe. And fourth, practice being gentle, respectful, and loving toward the life force in all things. In other words, behave as if the God in all life really mattered. The energy of love is sent out into the universe and connects with the same loving essence that is in all things. Fifth, determine that you will spend some time each day alone and in silence meditating on this principle. Repeat the principle over and over as a silent mantra. I am not an organism in an environment. I am an environment organism. By repeating these words to yourself, you will eventually begin to project this reality outward. And six, make the spaces of your life as sacred as possible. In your living space, bless all that surrounds you and fill your space with the life that plants, flowers, and animals bring. Spend time contemplating your living space as a holy place. The more you bring your environment alive with sacred thoughts and feelings, the more you will feel spiritually connected. The Sufi poet Rumi, almost a millennium ago, wrote a poem that reflects this consciousness. I'd like to share it here with you. It's called The Seed Market. He says, Can you find another market like this, where with one rose you can buy hundreds of rose gardens? Where for one seed you get a whole wilderness? For one weak breath, the divine wind? You've been fearful of being absorbed in the ground or drawn up by the air. Now your water bead lets go and drops into the ocean where it came from. It no longer has the form it had, but it's still water. The essence is the same. This giving up is not a repenting. It's a deep honoring of yourself. When the ocean comes to you as a lover, marry at once, quickly, for God's sake. Don't postpone it. Existence has no better gift. No amount of searching will find this. A perfect falcon, for no reason, has landed on your shoulder and become yours. 
A seventh suggestion is to become aware of how your judgments prevent you from connecting to whatever you are judging. A judgment is a definition of yourself as separate from that which you are judging. Remember that it is possible to look out on the world and not condemn it, to have absolutely no judgment or interpretation of it, but to just allow it to be. And an eighth suggestion. Have fun with the idea of yourself as a hologram. If you remember that you are a tiny piece of humanity reflected in your own little image and personality, then you have a green light to reflect the humanity that you would like in your world. You are one tiny bit of a six billion or so piece hologram, and you reflect all of those six billion pieces at every given moment of your life. This is the third principle of spiritual manifestation. We are all simultaneously our own beings and all that is outside us as well. We cannot ever separate ourselves from our environment while we are in a physical body. Knowing this puts us in touch with the energy of attraction that is the subject matter of the fourth principle. The fourth principle of spiritual manifestation says, you can attract to yourself what you desire. The central notion of manifesting is the understanding that you have within yourself the ability to attract the objects of your desire. Now this may still seem to you to be out of your power, but if you have understood the previous three principles, then you're beginning to know that this power is within you. Being able to attract your desires may seem more likely when you consider how things move from the world of the formless into the world of the form. In one of the most intriguing sentences in the New Testament, St. Paul addresses this process of creation. He says it this way, Things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. St. Paul is telling us that the creative energy is neither solid nor restricted. The physical world of form originates in something other than the form itself. St. Paul's words form the basis for my writing about this principle and for several of those to come in this tape. I believe they suggest how energy informs our ability to attract what we desire. St. Paul is giving us a clue about bringing our desires into the world of matter. Energy then becomes a force that we can tap into. In a film about his boyhood, Albert Einstein describes picking up a compass and watching it in fascination as the needle moved when he changed direction. He said that he became obsessed with understanding the invisible force that moved the compass needle. Where was the force located? Who controlled it? Why did it always work? Like magnetism, there is a force that has many characteristics that are quite impossible to detect with our physical senses. We call this force energy. Energy is in all things in our universe and has an impact upon objects around it with something that we describe as the power of attraction. In magnetic fields, we can easily see it at work, yet we're unable to detect the formless energy with our sensory apparatus. The force is there, attracting and repelling, and it is everywhere on our planet. If it is everywhere, then it is also within us. It seems unlikely that our senses will inform us any better than they help us comprehend how a magnetic pole works. We can see the results, but the force itself is always elusive and in motion. The essence of this fourth principle of manifesting is that we can utilize this energy because we are this energy. We can use this universal energy to bring to us objects of our desire because the same energy that is in what we desire is also in us and vice versa. It is simply a matter of alignment and will that allows us to tap into this force. Bringing things into the physical world is a process that we call creation. What we create involves the use of the same power that is in all that is created. It is only a matter of degree. There's absolutely no difference in the power that brings something from the world of waves into the world of particles and the power that brings your thoughts or mental pictures into form. I encourage you to listen to this again and again and commit it to memory. The world of spirit from which all matter derives and the world of matter comprise one harmonious whole. They are separate but always together, just like the peak of the wave and its base, separate but forming an inseparable whole. Think of manifesting as nothing more than transforming waves of possibility into particles of reality. The transforming process requires energy. This energy is invisible, but is always in everything, including us. Your mental pictures are related to this power of attraction. 
There is a power within you that allows you to form a thought or a picture. This mental picturing power is the energy of attraction that is in all creative processes. It is different in degree, but nevertheless identical with the power of attraction. This power is the very substance of life. You can't see, touch, or hear this power, but it is within you. In using this power, you are not in any way attempting to change or interfere with the laws of nature. You are fulfilling the laws. This undifferentiated power is the basis for the mysterious attraction that draws your desires to you. Think of yourself as a way that God has of particularizing. Then see your ability to formulate mental pictures as the divine creative power energizing through you. Can you see that the same creative energy that particularizes as yourself is what you use to manifest your desires? This power thrives on happiness, love, joy, contentment, and peace. The more blissful and loving you are, the more the Divine Spirit particularizes within you and the more godlike you become. It is through your thoughts, or how you use your power to create a thought, that all creative energy is attracted to you. If your mental pictures are of being surrounded by things and conditions that you desire, and they are rooted in joy and faith, your creative thoughts will attract these surroundings and conditions into your life. The power to even have a thought is a divine power. With this recognition of its sacredness, you form a vision or a mental picture. Finally, you hold it lovingly in place with the inner knowledge that the God force that brought everything in the universe into existence also created you. The form that this energy will take will be controlled and directed by your will or your mental picturing. It is waiting to take any direction you decide. There is a practice of mental picturing that you can master. The most important thing to remember as you practice mental picturing for the purposes of manifesting your desires is that humans never create anything. Our function is not to create, but to attract, combine, and distribute what already exists. Creations are really new combinations of already existing materials. There is one indispensable condition for the manifestation of your mental picture into the visible and concrete world, the necessity of picturing the fulfillment of your desire as if it is already accomplished on the spiritual plane. That's right. You must know within yourself that on the invisible level of your being, what you desire is already in place. You impress upon the universal mind the object of your desire, and you calmly and knowingly proceed to act upon that picture, allowing the greater intelligence and your own, which is a part of that greater intelligence, to work through you to produce the results. You abandon all fear, and return to the affairs of your life, assured that the necessary conditions will soon come into view or are already there. The key is to repeat the mental pictures until the truth of what you are affirming resonates within you without an ounce of doubt. And there will be times when it appears that it isn't working. If your picture doesn't manifest in the time span that you've designated, relax and retreat to your knowing that it is already in place in the spiritual realm. Time is simply not a recognizing feature of the all-creating wisdom. However, you will find it impossible to manifest if you are visualizing without an authentic will that is sufficiently steady to overcome any contrary idea or lack of faith in your own divine connection to God. And here we must talk about the value of secrecy. When we speak to others about our efforts to manifest, our power is weakened. In general, when we describe these activities, it is because the ego has entered the picture. This kind of approach considerably dissipates our power of attraction. Maintain privacy concerning your own unique powers to attract to you what you desire. In order to tap into the extraordinary energy and use it in the co-creation process, it must remain yours and yours alone. The moment you discuss it with anyone who is alive today is the moment it diminishes. The higher energy, which is infinite, must create its own vehicle for manifesting, and it does so in the privacy of those vehicles. We are talking here about a vital force, a God force. Let's look at the nature of this vital force. It's difficult to comprehend a force that we cannot see, or touch, or hear, or smell, and still know that it exists. It is similar to electricity. You plug in your appliance and you cannot see, touch, smell, or hear anything happening, but your electric hairdryer responds when you press the on switch. 
This is a good way to think of the vital force that is the all-creating God force as well. It is invisible, electrical in nature, always flowing, and always attracted to that which plugs into its source. A second characteristic of the life force energy is that it is always expanding, and it is unlimited in supply. The nature of the universe is abundance. It goes on beyond our concepts of beginnings and endings and boundaries. When we think we have it categorized and locked into a time-space boundary, it expands beyond our awareness, almost as if it must move further away from observation. You are an aspect of that force, and therefore you, too, are flowing, ever-expanding, and unlimited. It is your nature to be able to attract, to expand, to be unlimited. This force is in you, and this force is outside you. This force is you. By knowing the nature of this force and seeing yourself as a divine expression of it, and by going within to the power that permits you to picture a desire, and then tapping that power with a private, loving, cheerful knowing, you are on your way to using this vital force in ways that were unavailable to you with your conditioned view of yourself. Let's look at some ideas for putting this principle into work in your life. When first arising in the morning, take a few moments to be alone and ask yourself, how did the conditions of my life that I would like to change first come about? How can I facilitate making conscious contact with my unlimited, invisible source of energy? You'll soon realize that the conditions of your life have been manifested by you, even though you are not conscious of bringing them about. Your thoughts and mental pictures of lack and scarcity and self-absorption and authoritarianism and illness and guilt and worry and all of these have been put into the universal spirit and have manifested in your life. You can hasten your conscious contact by radiating a totally new kind of mental picture while applying this fourth principle. And then secondly, explore the possibility that the reason you believe that life is limiting is because you have assumed limitation to be in your life. Does your view of life include the natural creative process reproducing within yourself? Stay in this place within and you will know conscious contact with the divine, all-creating intelligence. And then thirdly, never limit the spirit in any way. If you experience any kind of friction, know that it is an error in your thinking and picturing. Just continue to tell spirit what you want without telling it how you want it to happen. Then retreat in faith and trust. Fourthly, keep your mental picturing to yourself. What you want to attract is a private matter between you and God. And fifthly, begin to act as if what you would like to attract is already in your life. If you want to create healing, formulate the picture, radiate out that energy to connect with the all-creating energy, be cheerful and trusting in your knowing, share it with no one, and then begin acting in a new, healthy manner. If you want to materialize more prosperity, then start the process of thinking abundantly and acting that way also, giving thanks for all that has manifested into your life. And sixth, I recommend that you browse through Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass daily. Here's a portion that speaks of our oneness with the divine energy. Listen to Walt Whitman. Athwart the shapeless vastness of space, how should I think, how breathe a single breath, how speak if, out of myself, I could not launch to those superior universes. Swiftly I shrivel at the thought of God, at nature and its wonders, time and space and death, but that I, turning, call to thee, O soul, thou actual me, thou matest time, smilest contented death, and fillest, swellest full the vastness of space. And so it is with you, no different from Walt Whitman or anyone else in the universe. Here's our fifth principle of manifesting. Honoring your worthiness to receive. In order to become a manifester, literally taking part in the process of co-creating your life and attracting to yourself the objects of your heart's desire, you must know that you are worthy of receiving. This will mean examining the attitudes that you knowingly and unknowingly hold about your life. Your thoughts, which are the architects of the foundation of your material world, are what you want to examine. You can remind yourself all day long that the same power that brought anything into the physical world also brought you, but if you do not feel worthy, you will disrupt the natural flow of energy into your life and create a blockage that makes manifestation impossible. The fifth principle reminds you that you are worthy of abundance, 
If your thoughts are based on an image of unworthiness for any reason at all, you will manifest what those thoughts impart to the universal mind. The energy described in the fourth principle will align with what it is that you radiate. As a man thinks, so is he, are not just empty words. Thinking that abundance is incompatible with spirituality is a myth that influences many of us and is the largest impediment there is to feeling worthy. What do we mean when we use this word selfish? The myth that abundance and spirituality are incompatible is fueled by thoughts that it is selfish and improper to visualize and desire material things. Let's examine this attitude and determine if you have been influenced into believing it to be your truth. Take a look around your world and notice the abundance and endlessness of our universe. It goes on and on beyond our ability to imagine its vastness. This abundance flows from the same energy that comprises our fundamental essence. It is you. You are it. Material form is how spirit makes itself known to us while we are in form ourselves. Spirit manifests in trees and oceans and fish, birds, minerals, vegetables, flowers, and you. Matter is not an illusion or something that ought not to be, but it is the necessary means through which spirit differentiates itself on this plane of existence. To feel that it is selfish or non-spiritual to desire and manifest is to divide the world of spirit and the world of matter into polar opposites. When we adopt an attitude of spirit being incompatible with matter, we are denying the spirit that is in matter as its originating energy. We also deny the validity of ourselves as spiritual beings. When we shift to seeing that together they comprise one harmonious whole, we remove the stigma of selfishness. Just as each one of us is one harmonious whole comprised of spirit and matter, so too is the entire universe. The process of life taking form is a mystery. That mystery is governed by a creative energy that is knowable when we genuinely feel worthy of receiving its blessings in form. Abundance is the way of the creative force in the universe. You are entitled to have abundance in your life and to radiate prosperity to all that you encounter in your world. Nothing is gained by making yourself small and insignificant other than to manifest smallness and insignificance into your life. There are some core components of worthiness. Everything you need to master in order to make this fifth principle a working model in your life is available as a mental activity. You do not need to go out into the world and conquer it in any way. It is simply a matter of changing your mind about your basic worthiness to receive all of God's blessings, be they material or otherwise. Here are five major perceptions of beings who know they are worthy and deserving of all of God's blessings. The first says, my self-esteem comes from myself. This person's statement of his or her inner perceptions might be something like the following, as a child of God, my worthiness is a given. I am not divided into spirit and body. Rather, I am a part of the all-knowing creation called God itself. Too often the ideas of other egos are what constitute our impressions of ourselves. We listen to the admonitions of others who have low self-regard and who are attempting to exert influence and power over us. It is beyond the scope of most young children to resist these ideas. But as adults we can look back at this hypothesis and free ourselves from its absurdity. You must know within that you are part of the light that lighteth every man. You are evidence of the existence of God, and in your own particularized individuality, you have God within you. Therefore, you must be able to say with conviction, God is me, and I am God. It is this truth that will free you from your feelings of unworthiness to attract to yourself all that you desire. Your desires are the very tools that allow you to grow and experience the perfection of the universe. They take you beyond any limitations that you might have embraced and lead you to a higher spiritual awareness. Even the idea of achieving enlightenment and mastery is a desire, and one you must honor. A second statement of those who feel worthy. I accept myself without complaint. A person with this self-perception thinks something like the following. I am willing to face everything about myself without lapsing into self-contempt or repudiating my essential value as a piece of God. Self-acceptance is something that must be unconditionally known within ourselves. To accept oneself is not necessarily to accept every behavior. Rather, it is a refusal to engage in sabotaging acts of self-loathing. If you are in a state of self-rejection, you cannot feel worthy of the munificence of the universe. Your inner energy is centered in what is wrong with yourself and with complaining to yourself and anyone who will listen. 
Self-acceptance is nothing more than a shift in consciousness. It requires only a change of mind. If your hair is falling out, then you have the choice to mask it, worry about it, or accept it. Acceptance means that you honor your body and the divine intelligence that is at work. And when someone else implies that you have a problem because your hair is falling out, you don't even know how to relate to their observation. Acceptance removes the label of problem. This is not a faked attitude. It is merely removing the ego from your inner assessments, which are centered on the approval of others. With self-acceptance, you are able to honestly say, I am what I am, and I accept it. Once this attitude is firmly in place from a position of self-honesty, your worthiness to receive the gifts of the universe become aligned with that divine power. A third attitude of self-acceptance. I take full responsibility for my life and what it is and is not. To be willing to accept total responsibility for yourself puts you in a position of being worthy of receiving and attracting the objects of your desire. If someone else is responsible for your perceived shortcomings and you are blaming them for these troubles, then you are also saying that in order to manifest your heart's desire, you need to have the permission of those others. This act of abdicating responsibility destroys your ability to empower yourself to higher levels of awareness. I come from the position that there are absolutely no accidents and that everything that occurs in my life has a lesson attached to it and that I brought it into my life. Thus, if I am having a negative thought and at the same moment I bump my head on a cupboard door, I say, what was I thinking at that moment? and I take full responsibility for correcting those negative thoughts and for the bump that reminded me to correct that kind of thinking. This little game serves me in the sense of taking full responsibility for my life and eradicating the inclination to blame other people or circumstances. I trust in this inner knowledge. I rely on seemingly coincidental happenings, and I know that I am responsible for all of it. As this sense of responsibility has grown, I find it impossible to blame anyone for anything in my life. The willingness to be responsible without complaining puts you into the natural flow of all divine energy. With an attitude of self-responsibility, you will notice that the heavens are exceedingly cooperative. A fourth attitude of self-acceptance says, I do not choose to accept guilt into my life. This mindset creates thoughts such as, I will not use up the precious currency of my life, my present moments, immobilized with guilt over what happened in the past. This statement requires you to know the difference between a. Genuine regret and learning from the past and b. Remaining in a state of reproach or guilt today. Learning from one's mistakes and taking corrective action are spiritually and psychologically sound practices. You did it. You didn't like the way you felt afterwards, so you decide not to repeat the behavior. That is not guilt. Guilt is when you continue to feel immobilized and depressed. Those feelings keep you from living effectively in the present. When you are filled with guilt, your energy is awash with anguish and self-reproach. You are so down on yourself that you are feeling unworthy of receiving blessings from the universe or anyone in it. Persistent feelings of guilt will prevent you from manifesting anything worthwhile because you are attracting the very same things that you are putting out to the universe. For example, if you are chronically overweight or addicted, your internal sentence of guilt sounds something like this, I am really going to love myself when I finally am at a normal weight. Or, I will truly value myself as a worthwhile human being when I am finally over this addiction once and for all. These internal sentences need to be shifted to, I love myself while I am overweight. I am not this weight in the first place, and I refuse to think of myself in self-degrading terms regardless of the condition of my body. I am love, and I extend this love to all of me. This same kind of inner programming must take place for addictions or anything else that you feel guilty about. By removing the inclination to wallow in self-reproach, we remove the idea that by suffering in the present moment, we will redeem ourselves and can pay for our sins with guilt. Life doesn't work this way. The solution is in loving yourself and in trusting in God that your shortcomings are nothing more than lessons leading you to a new spiritual level. And finally, a fifth assessment of those who have self-acceptance. I understand the importance of having harmony between my thoughts, my feelings, and my behavior. To the extent that you remain incongruent in any of these three areas of thinking, feeling, or behaving, you will impede the process of heightened awareness and the ability to manifest your heart's desire. This is the last of the five points that contribute to your feelings of worthiness about receiving God's munificence into your life. It is also the most significant because it defines your level of integrity. To have thoughts about how you would like to conduct your life, to posit these thoughts as your essential way of being, and then to feel guilty, fearful, anxious, or anything else as a result of not living up to these inner positions, 
results in addictive, manipulative, and self-defeating behavior. To be congruent, you must be honest about your own thoughts. If you are honest with yourself, you will find that your emotional reactions will be consistent with your inner world. You will feel peaceful and content, and this will be apparent in your behavior. This is true for virtually everything about your life. Your thoughts about health, relationships, prosperity, God, work, recreation, whatever. If these thoughts are rooted in love, and you honestly know that you are here to express love, kindness, and forgiveness toward yourself, toward your work and co-workers, toward the money you receive, toward your spiritual beliefs, then you will be in harmony, and you will welcome the blessings that result from your personal conduct in these matters. However, if you embrace these thoughts yet fail to act on them in the daily working of your life, you will feel incongruent, and consequently, you will not feel that you are deserving of desires being fulfilled, being eaten up inside, in your own private corner of awareness that is not available to anyone else other than God. You will behave in self-defeating ways that verify your lack of inner congruity. These five attitudes provide you with the tools for creating an inner atmosphere of worthiness. They all reflect an ability to live peacefully in the present moment and to discard many of the attitudes of your past that keep you in a constant state of feeling powerless and unworthy of being able to manifest more blessings and happiness into your life. And then it's necessary to begin to look at how you can unbond yourself from your past wounds. The inclination to bond to our wounds rather than move past them traps us in a constant state of feeling unworthy. A person who has experienced traumatic events in life, such as incest or abuse or sexual molestation or the death of loved ones or traumatic illnesses or accidents or family disruptions or drug addictions, can become bonded to them and replay them for attention or pity. Very often the tale of these woes is told with a sort of urgency for the listener to know how horrible the wounding was and still is. The ego uses this energy as a power play in individual and group situations to encourage discussion of one's struggle to survive the wounding. This can keep individuals from advancing spiritually and reinforce the image of themselves as unfortunate. The tendency to bond with the wounds of our lives reminds us of how unworthy we are of receiving anything that we really would like because we remain in a state of suffering. The more these painful stories are recalled and repeated, the more we are guaranteed of not attracting our desires. Notice your body when it is wounded. An open wound actually closes up quite quickly. Just imagine what it would be like if that wound remained open for a long time. It would become infected and ultimately would kill the entire organism. The closing up of a wound and allowing it to heal can work the same way in your inner world of thoughts. When you go backward and continuously relive your pain, including labeling yourself incest survivor, alcoholic, sexual abuse survivor, you do so because of your inner experiences of bitterness. This harvest of bitterness keeps you from feeling worthy. So don't lead with your injuries. Deal with them and ask family and friends to be compassionate while you are grieving or recuperating. Then ask them to kindly remind you when it has taken on the form of a predictable response. The way out of bonding to your wounds is through forgiveness. Forgiveness is the most powerful thing you can do for your physiology and your spirituality. Forgiveness means that you fill yourself with love and you radiate that love outward and refuse to hang on to the venom or hatred that was engendered by the behaviors that caused the wounds in the first place. Forgiveness is a spiritual act of love for yourself, and it sends a message to everyone, including yourself, that you are an object of love, and that is what you are going to impart. Feeling worthy is essential to being able to attract to yourself what you desire. It is simply a matter of common sense. If you don't feel that you deserve something, why would the divine energy that is in all things send it your way? Let's look at a plan for adopting and honoring your worthiness to receive and attract from the divine source. The word inspiration literally means to be infused with spirit, in spirit if you will. Practice doing what you love and loving what you do each day. This puts you in spirit and literally provides you with the enthusiasm for being a worthy recipient of God's grace. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek root entheos, to be filled with God. Then make every effort to remove internal habits of pessimism, negativity, judgment, complaints, gossip, cynicism, resentment, and fault-finding from your vocabulary and your inner dialogue. Replace them with optimism, love, acceptance, kindness, and peace 
as your way of processing your world and the people in it. Then give yourself quiet time each day to erase feelings of unworthiness. And also read spiritual literature and poetry and listen to soothing classical music whenever possible. I have found that simply reading the poetry of Walt Whitman or Rabindranath Tagore or Rumi puts everything into a more sacred perspective for me. This beautiful poem from Khalil Gibran's The Prophet is an example of such literature. Pay particular attention to the words, Your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and nights, and for the soul walks upon all paths. Here's Khalil Gibran on self-knowledge. And a man said, Speak to us on self-knowledge. And he answered, saying, Your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and nights, but your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge. You would know in words that which you would have always known in thought. You would touch with your fingers the naked body of your dreams. And it is well you should. The hidden wellspring of your soul must needs rise and run murmuring to the sea. And the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes. But let there be no scales to weigh your unknown treasure. And seek not the depths of your knowledge with staff or sounding line. For self is a sea boundless and measureless. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Allow yourself to be surrounded by things of beauty as much as possible. Each evening I leave my typewriter and I go out to the beach and I experience the magnificence of the sun setting over the Gulf of Mexico. To be a part of this sunset fills me with a sense of home beyond this planet and opens me up to the deeper nature within myself. I could never feel unworthy of the grace and munificence of the universe when I'm immersed in such beauty. Virtually any experience of beauty has a tendency to remove doubt about your own divinity and connection to the ultimate truth that is in everything and everyone. And then practice kindness toward yourself and others as frequently as possible. Give up your need to be right and to win in favor of being kind, and you will soon know the bliss of inner peace. Remember, your highest self only wants peace. When you are practicing kindness, peace shows up right on schedule. When you are at peace with yourself and your world, you know that you are a worthy recipient of all that comes your way. Make it your own special mission to be kind to others each day at least once, and to extend the same privilege to yourself as much as possible. Also, begin to process the universe as a friendly rather than an unfriendly place. Place all of your wounds from the earlier stages of your life into the category Lessons for Life. Remember, for every act of evil, there are a million acts of kindness. This universe runs on the energy of harmony and balance. Breathe in that energy and breathe out the ideas of your being life's victim. And finally, Say it over and over until it registers. I am what I am, and I am worthy of the abundance that is the universe and all that is in it, including me. You are now on a path of knowing you are worthy of attracting and manifesting in your world. You are aware of your highest self. You trust in yourself and the divine wisdom that created you. You know that you are not separate from your environment and that the power to attract is within you. The next principle involves the energy of love and how important it is to know and experience it in all of your being before you begin applying the last three principles of manifestation. Our sixth principle for spiritual manifestation is called connecting to the divine source with unconditional love. There's a wonderful quote from Mirabai. It says this as she talks about herself. Mirabai knows that to find the divine one the only indispensable is love. There is no greater power in heaven or on earth than pure unconditional love. This is the heart of the sixth principle of manifestation. The nature of the God force, that unseen intelligence in all things, which causes the material world and is the center of both the spiritual and physical plane, is best described as pure unconditional love. It is the glue that holds all things material in place, and keeps them from collapsing into uncountable particles. This God force is the oversoul to which we are always connected because we are localized extensions of that force. You may feel infinitely worthy of attracting to yourself material and spiritual prosperity, 
But if you are not living the way of unconditional love, you are interfering with your ability to manifest in your life. In order to be divinely aligned with the universal infinite energy, you must become unconditional love. This energy of love really dissolves all limitations. When I speak of love emanating from your soul and from the divine consciousness of God, I speak of something that the lower self or the ego cannot grasp. I am not speaking about feeling good toward others, romantic love, showering everyone with affection, or touchy-feely behavior here. This unconditional love is an experience of the harmony of life. It is simply too deep and too profound for our ordinary selves to activate. The energy of unconditional love is the power behind creation. It guides all of our natural laws. This love can be imagined as a vibration that carries thought forms from one's mind into material expression. In its highest nature, love is the force that we recognize as the will of God. It is the alchemy that we embrace to make sense of how things are materialized from the world of spirit. I suggest you embark on an experiment in which you practice unconditional love for several days, perhaps even a week. Make this a private activity, but vow to yourself that you will allow only unconditional loving thoughts to emanate from your consciousness. Refuse to have judgmental or critical thoughts. In your quiet time, think only peace and love. In all of your relationships, think and act in only loving ways. Extend loving thoughts and energy wherever and whenever you encounter anyone or anything. Become unconditional love for this period of time. This practice of becoming unconditional love is a prerequisite to the manifesting process. By pouring love into your immediate environment and practicing gentleness in all of your thoughts, words, and actions, your immediate circle of friends will begin responding in a whole new way. Furthermore, this act becomes expansive very quickly, and you can radiate this love to your community and to people you read about in newspapers, including those who are labeled terrorists, murderers, scam artists, and the like. You emphasize the un in unconditional love. You become detached and loving toward all. You are not loving the hostile act, but you are loving the spirit that is blocked in those who are harmful and unloving. When you can live this way and reject all thoughts and actions that are not of an unconditionally loving nature, you will experience the alchemy of your spirit and know how to overcome limitations in your life. This is a task that your conditioning will not easily encourage, but for a few days you can persevere just so you know what the divine universal spirit is like. It judges no one and nothing. It does not moralize. It does not show favoritism. It merely exists as an unconditional love, radiating harmony and allowing everything and everyone to unfold. What can you expect as you practice a few days of being total unconditional love? You will feel yourself becoming a different person. You will feel at peace virtually all of the time. Your relationships will be more deeply spiritual. Most significantly, you will begin recognizing the coincidences of your life with greater regularity. Your thought forms of unconditional love will begin to produce what you desire without your even being aware of how it is happening. There's an off-quoted passage in the New Testament that seems appropriate here. It's Corinthians 13 on love. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies they will cease, and where there are tongues they will be stilled, and where there is knowledge it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Yes, and the greatest of these is love. 
I'm well aware of the improbability of living an unconditionally loving life in all of our moments. I imagine your ego is protesting that this idea is absurd because you are only human and humans have shortcomings. Nevertheless, I ask you to do this exercise for a few days or a week. You see, I know that it will become habitual when you feel the richness of your life with this new awareness. There's something that is called the process of detached observation. One of the great meditation exercises that I learned many years ago involves imagining lifting yourself out of your body and floating into space so far that you are actually observing the entire planet. If you do this, try to imagine what the Earth is like without you on it. It is a very difficult task for your ego to even contemplate the world without you on it. Next, begin to observe the planet without any judgment, refusing to label anything good or bad, right or wrong. Simply instruct yourself to notice, allow, and send unconditional love. The process of being a detached observer occurs in the silence of your contemplations or meditations. Begin by seeking out time to be quiet and enter this inner place of love. It is in that silence that you will come to truly know the divine energy of unconditional love. It's a difficult thing for our egos to contemplate this concept of oneness. Unconditional love and becoming a co-creator in your life is possible when you know that God is not separate from you. You and God are one and the same. In the New Testament, Jesus says to the multitudes, I have said, ye are gods. And later, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. What it means to be in a state of oneness is that you know the unconditional love that God has for all of creation is also the unconditional love that can be you if you make that choice. If you place restrictions on that love or withhold it dependent on your judgments and hatreds, then you make it a conditional love and remove yourself from the possibility of co-creating with God. We have unconditional freedom for our thoughts to be what they are. That is how you are loved. That is your gift from the Divine Creator, expressed through your individuality. Take that freedom away, and you are no longer a human being. You lose your humanity when you lose the unconditional love that allows you to think as you choose. Now suppose that you're able to function in the same unconditionally loving way, simply allowing without judging you would be experiencing oneness. Your will and God's will would not be in conflict. Use this love for the purpose of creation. Every moment that you create by radiating unconditionally loving thoughts is a reflection of the same love that was responsible for your creation. This unconditional love is really a power. The ability to reach a higher state of being where there seems to be almost no delay between the creation of a thought form and having that thought form show up can be viewed in terms of unconditional love and an absence of making demands on or judging the world. This is a power that I know is possible for each of us when we begin to adopt the basic principles of spiritual manifestation. Most of us simply do not recognize how truly powerful we are by virtue of our own ability to create thoughts, and out of these thoughts attract to ourselves the abundance of the universe. When we think rationally about this power, we immediately think of the conflict between having a free will and having a destiny. This conflict often obviates the need within us to think and live in unconditionally loving ways. Let's take a quick look at this matter of destiny, which is in the title of this tape, and put it into a different context. Destiny is not preordained. Destiny is ordained totally by you. Every single moment of your now existence is the result of your previous thought. The idea that everything is already laid out for you in advance is a hallucination. You can and do manifest your own destiny. Your free will is your gift of unconditional love. You create the destiny with this free will, and when you venture off the path of unconditional love, you are simply living an illusion. The illusion is that the thoughts that you have of your separateness from God's will put you into an obsequious position, that God is something you must fight or fear. Obviously, if this were true, God could not at the same time be all-loving. So what it means here is that you want to know the joy of unconditional love. The most important thing that you will gain from cultivating unconditional love will be freedom from hate and violence. When these thoughts are removed, you discover the presence of joy and peace. This is an automatic reaction to unconditional love because you are in harmony with the creative source. The ego identifies you primarily as a physical body, separate from God, and in need of constant stroking to massage your self-importance. 
When you simply say this is an illusion and it doesn't really exist, those ideas are replaced with unconditional love. And the joy you experience is really the denial of the false and an affirmation of the truth of your being. You are absolutely free when you are not consumed with your self-importance. You are free when you no longer need to be stroked, coddled, and approved of by everyone you meet. There is a great sense of joy in feeling free. Think of times when you have felt the freest in your life, when the pressures to perform are off, when you are walking in nature, when you are in solitude and communing with God. Joy, freedom, and unconditional love are inseparable. They flow from the experience of each other. To be joyful is to hold on to nothing and to have no restrictions. This is also the feeling of freedom, and it is a result of embracing the unconditional love of the divine energy that is the center of your being. This is not to say that one ought not to enjoy a massage, a delicious meal, lovemaking, and all of the pleasures of the body, but it is the mind that is processing and allowing you to experience the pleasure. It is the mind that makes it real. Your purpose is to align your mind with the unconditional love that is the divine source of all material things, including your body. With that alignment comes joy and power. When one drop of water separates from the ocean, it becomes a speck that is essentially powerless and weak. But when it aligns with its source, the ocean itself, it is powerful beyond what is possible as an individual drop of ocean. And so it is with you. Unconditional love is really nothing more than the absence of fear. The ego is where fears originate, with constant messages that you are incomplete and need more, that you need to win to be better in comparison to others. With its unceasing pressure, the ego keeps you in a constant state of turmoil and anxiety. Here is where all fears are birthed and nurtured within you. To accept unconditional love as your premise for living, you will have to tell the ego that there is no need to prove anything and that all you want or hope for is already here. With this kind of declaration, fear is removed from your life and is replaced with love. Remember the biblical quote, Perfect love casteth out all fear. This principle of unconditional love as a prerequisite to manifesting your own destiny is a tough one to put into practice full time. Yet you can begin this process by working on it one step at a time, beginning right now. Here are a few of the ways of putting unconditional love into practice in your life. Remember to keep uppermost in mind that love transforms. Unconditional love heals the body and the mind. And then also remember that the polarity of love is fear. Fear is a current of energy that literally runs through your body and is produced when you feel cut off from the source of unconditional love. Every time you experience fear, ask yourself, what's going on that I have substituted fear for love in this moment? Also, begin to acquire a private, non-publicized and regular habit of meditating. With every breath you take, feel yourself taking in unconditional love. With every exhalation, expel thoughts of fear. Then pick one day to practice this exercise with a partner of your choice. Make a decision to think, act, and radiate nothing but unconditional love for the entire 24-hour period, including your dreams. If this works for you for one day, see if you can extend it for another day or two. Also, try making a decision to turn over your most difficult challenges in the area of unconditional love to God. Simply turn them over with a request such as, I have been unable to bring love into my life in these areas, and I am asking for your divine guidance in accomplishing this. Also, in your silent moments of prayer, do not be afraid to ask for help. And then know the connection between manifesting your heart's desire and unconditional love. Without your connection to this love, you lose your connection to the creative process. Unconditional love is in all things you wish to attract as well as in you. Keep it honestly, and you keep your ability to know that you are a God. Lose it, and you lose your godliness. It is that simple. And finally, make your word law. If you say it, live up to it lovingly. This gives you a sense of inner balance. The universe runs on balance, and the energy that keeps it in balance is love. By declaring yourself a person who keeps his word, you align yourself with the loving essence of the world. This concludes the sixth principle for manifesting. Unconditional love is the cornerstone of your mental picturing. You refuse to allow any contrary ego-driven thought to enter the inner kingdom of love. If you activate this principle, you will have revealed the truth that eludes most people. It is with unconditional love that you find your true connection to the divine energy that is in all things. 
Our seventh principle of spiritual manifestation is simply meditating to the sound of creation. This seventh principle of manifesting will challenge your conditioning probably more than any of the other eight principles. However, while it contradicts your beliefs about how you fit into the universe, it also expands your ability to create and attract the objects of your heart's desire. Others who have done this meditation on a regular basis have experienced dramatic shifts in their lives and have been able to manifest what they previously believed to be impossible. As you begin opening yourself to the soul-nourishing practice of chanting to the sounds of creation, spend some time carefully studying the other eight principles. When you begin to practice the two daily manifesting meditations, you need to trust in your highest self and meditate with unconditional love. Reviewing the other eight principles will help to make trust and love available. Meditating with sound can work dramatically in your personal life and can also facilitate a new awareness of our collective abilities to manifest a world free of the demands and petty issues of the ego. I feel blessed to have a spiritual teacher, Sri Guruji, make these meditations available to me to teach to others. Sounds have the power to generate your ability to attract to yourself that which you desire. Three key words describing the principle are the title of the following section. Listen carefully to these three words. Sounds have power. Sounds are a powerful energy. Every sound is a vibration made of waves oscillating at a particular frequency. The frequency range of the human ear is approximately 16 to roughly 40,000 vibrations per second. Sound is the intermediary between abstract ideas and concrete form in the material world. Sounds literally mold the abstract world of thought and spirit into shapes. In ancient ceremonial rites, words, sounds, and shapes combine to achieve certain ends. Each letter in a word signifies a sound and records the expression of a particular sound. Differing sounds were recorded for their own purposes. Sounds have an impact on us in a myriad of ways. The discordant and harassing sounds of machines, thudding, screaming, grating noises, bombard our consciousness and make it difficult to be serene and peaceful. Discordant sounds can cause internal illness or disease. The sound also has healing properties when it is harmonious and soothing. Healing takes place to the accompaniment of soothing harmonies and nature's music interspersed with spiritually nourishing silence. In addition to healing, sound is used in the creation process which is the central concern of this seventh principle of spiritual manifestation. When we use the sounds of nature that are most consistent with the act of creation, we begin to attract the material form that we desire. Learning how to use sound is a way of harnessing its power for manifesting thought into the world of form. Manifesting is knowing how to make contact with that spiritual vibrational frequency while we are living inside a body in a materialized world. Pay attention to words and sounds because they can attract positive or negative influences into your life. Harmonious sounds are the ones that most contribute to a balanced and creative life. But before going into the actual use of meditation sounds, it is necessary to learn how to prepare yourself to use sounds in your daily meditation. You need to gain access to a method that will take you beyond the mind to a state of consciousness that transcends your thoughts. This higher state of consciousness beyond the mind is called Siddhi Awareness, S-I-D-D-H-I, -D -D Siddhi Awareness. Siddhi Awareness, or Siddhi Consciousness, is a perfect state of awareness in which there is a complete absence of doubt and no delay between the origination of a thought and its materialization into the world of form. It is an unlimited state of being in which creation occurs instantly without any time lag from thought to form. When we contemplate this state of grace, our minds challenge the idea and provide us with many reasons as to why it is impossible. Siddhi consciousness, however, has absolutely nothing to do with the mind. Let that sink in. Siddhi consciousness is beyond the mind. This state of graceful being has nothing to do with the mind, whose nature is a constant inner monologue. The mind frets continually about an unlimited number of desires that can never be adequately fulfilled. You can give your body great pleasures with booze and sex, give it fancy automobiles and delectable gourmet meals, body massages, and every other imaginable delight. The next morning, when it recovers, your mind has a new list of demands taped to your forehead, asking for more and more of what it can never get enough of. This is the nature of the mind, which is ruled by the ego. Your mind, then, is only a barrier to experiencing city consciousness, wherein you are in a state of bliss and complete acceptance, 
and your desires are the same as your experience of life. Your mind blocks the vision of your highest awareness. Your highest self has its own language. When your body is stilled and totally in the present, thoughts disappear. Then you can start the exquisite process of meditating with sound. It is the magic of this sound meditation that I am going to explain in the seventh principle. This is a siddha technique to take you beyond the constraints of the ego and the mind to a place within yourself where you can change your vibrational frequency through the use of sounds of creation. There's a magic to the sound of creation. As you begin to incorporate these ideas of the power of sound into your consciousness, going beyond the darkness of your mind to the light of your highest self, think about these words that open the book of John in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word God has the same sound that is in virtually all of the names for the original Creator. All traditions describe a creator of the word and humankind. Here is a list of names used for the creator. Ra, Krishna, Rama, Buddha, Adone, Brahman, Siddha, Shiva, Jehovah, Kali Durga, Tat, Gayana, Mahanta, Mahavira, Anu, Atva, Nanak, Yahweh, God, Allah, the obvious sound that is in all of these names for the Creator is the sound Ah. Ah expresses a feeling of bliss and joy. The sounds of creation and joy are synonymous. It is not an accident that the name for the Creator in virtually all languages contains the sound Ah. Ah is the only sound that humans make effortlessly, simply by taking in a breath and without moving the lips, the tongue, the jaw, or the teeth. If you move any of these, the sound changes. Ah is the sound of effortless perfection, as is creation itself effortless and perfect. Ah, the sound of creation, is one sound you will want to use as you practice the language of Siddhi consciousness. It takes you beyond the incessant self-dialogue that characterizes your mind. When you repeat the sound Ah in connection with your manifestation meditation practice, you are literally repeating the name of God. In Reflections of the Self, Swami Muktananda gives these words to his devotees who desire to know more about the state of Siddhi consciousness. With eyes brimming with love, sing his name. All inner mysteries will be disclosed. Every bird and plant will reveal itself to you as Brahman. The knowledge of Vedanta will manifest everywhere. O oh, dear one, keep chanting God's name while sitting or standing or involved in the world. Never forget him. Unite your mind with the Self. He explained that these names for God have specific combinations of inherently powerful syllables that have the ability to call forth the experience of God within us. Making these sounds acquaints us, perhaps for the first time, with the subtle God force within ourselves. Thousands of years ago, Patanjali set down his highly celebrated Yoga Sutras. They were designed to help guide seekers to the highest state of awareness, Siddhi Consciousness. He offered this advice, Repeat and Meditate. An Aum. Aum is a symbol for the universal sound of creation. Repeating this sound causes the disappearance of obstacles and an awakening of a new, higher consciousness that is the creative energy. Continually chant God's name is the advice of the masters of self-awareness to those who seek to participate in the act of creating and manifesting. The sound Ah is the sound of God. Make the repetition of the name of God a daily meditation practice and you will literally transform yourself into this universal sound of creation. You will become one with the sound that mediates between the world of form and the highest frequencies of the spiritual world. This creation meditation is also involved with two chakras of the body. Of the seven chakras of the body, two are significant in learning this manifesting technique. The base chakra, the sex center, is one, and the third eye, located between the eyebrows, is the other. Imagine for yourself a channel between the base chakra and your third eye. You are going to clear this imaginary passageway between these two chakras and feel yourself open the third eye so that you can imaginatively project your manifesting energy out the new opening. The base chakra is the center of procreation. The third eye chakra is for the purpose of manifestation. Think of your third eye as the part of you that makes contact with the physical world that is invisible to the naked eye. You are attempting to open this third eye through the language of your city consciousness. 
Now remembering that ah is the sound of joy as well as the God sound, think about the sound that accompanies the process of procreation. Ah is the most common sound heard in the very act of procreation, and more often than not God's name is repeated as a soul arrives from the world of the unseen into the world of materialized form. Oh God! Oh my God! Ah! Initially this may seem amusing, yet it is incontrovertible that these are universal clues to the process of manifestation. The energy released through the root or base chakra brings about procreation. And what has taken place here? A release of energy from the base chakra received by another base chakra and a soul connects to form, from the unseen to the manifested, all accompanied by the sound of ah. Learning this technique of sound manifesting really involves nothing more than opening up the channel that exists between these two chakras in your body. Opening the third eye is an inner exercise of putting your attention at the third eye or mind chakra and projecting through it, feeling the joy that is associated with the sound, ah. You experience it leaving the limits of your physical body, embracing that which you want to manifest and bringing it back to you. Implement this sound meditation in your morning practice. I have created a cassette tape and a compact disc called Meditations for Manifesting, which guides you through this morning meditation. In addition, that recording guides you through the second meditation, which takes place in the evening. However, here you put your attention on gratitude for all that has manifested into your life. This is also the subject matter of the ninth and final principle. Now we listen to the sound of that which is manifested. There's a second sound that reflects the vibrational frequency of manifestations in the physical plane. The sound is OM. If you reduce anything that you can observe on the physical plane to its ultimate sound vibration, you would hear the sound OM. This is the sound that women of ancient times meditated to while bringing their babies into the world. Whereas AH is the sound of creation, OM is the sound of that which is already created. OM expresses gratitude for all that has manifested. There's a basic relationship between our level of awareness and the vibrations of the universe. This is why I include the OM meditation in the manifestation process. Repeating the OM sound in the evening tunes you to a higher state of awareness and to gratitude for all that has manifested into your life. Repeating this sound as a mantra of gratitude is one of the most joyous feelings you will ever experience, causing you to be in harmony with your environment. Using the OM sound is a way of bonding to all that manifests for you, in whatever form it shows up. It creates a peaceful space and contributes to your identifying with the manifesting principle. These two sounds, ah and om, used on a daily basis, form the basis for your becoming adept at connecting with what you desire and understanding totally the message of this tape, which is that you indeed manifest your own desires and destiny. Now let's take a look at the practice of meditating for manifesting. Manifesting and meditating cannot be separated. They are like the crest and the trough of the wave, separate and distinct from each other, but always together. You cannot become adept at manifesting the desires of your heart if you are unwilling to devote time to the practice of meditation. Meditation is simply the act of being quiet with yourself and shutting down the constant monologue that fills the inner space of your being. That inner noise is a shield preventing you from knowing the highest self. Engaging in sound meditation is a useful way of accomplishing inner silence and removing the influences of the constant chatter that is largely produced by the ego. The best times for meditating using this manifesting technique of repetitive sounds are at sunrise and sunset. If you are unaccustomed to arising at or before sunrise, make an effort to establish this discipline for a trial period of 90 days. What you want to do is establish yourself as a disciplined person. Early morning, particularly prior to sunrise, is the best time of day to awaken. The silence allows you to feel close to God. You can feel the energy of healing and solutions in the silence. Use specific acts of personal courage to awaken during these hours, knowing that the time will provide you with far more rest than the remaining hours of your scheduled sleep. When the sun first begins to show itself in the morning, its energy breaking out of the darkness is most intense. This is the ideal time to begin your manifesting meditation.
Find a comfortable place to sit. What makes you feel most relaxed and at peace is the perfect posture. If at all possible, it is advisable to do this outdoors. Gently place your forefinger and thumb together on each hand. Close your eyes and allow yourself approximately 20 minutes for this morning practice. Take in a few long, deep breaths and exhale, becoming aware of the pattern of your breathing and the feeling of filling your lungs. Then place your attention on the root or base chakra, the sex center, and move your attention up the passageway between your root chakra and your third eye chakra. Think of this as a channel that has been clogged, and think of the third eye space as an opening that has been sealed for a long time that you are going to open with your new inner etheric energy. Now take a deeper, longer breath of air, filling your lungs, and as you release the breath, say out loud the sound, ah, with as much emotion and volume as you can imagine. Ah. Place your attention on clearing the channel with the sound of ah. While you are doing the ah meditation, add to your mental picture what it is that you would like to be able to create or manifest without being at all attached to how it will surface in your life. Repeat the sound of ah as your mantra for the entire time. However, do it out loud and with emotion for only approximately the first one-third of the time. Move your attention up and down the inner passageway between the root chakra and the third eye chakra. With the inner energy that you are feeling from the sound of creation resonating within you, open this third eye in your mental picture and propel the creative force through it into the world of form. Imagine its release from your inner being to a point at which it circles the world and surrounds the objects of your desire. Trust that this energy will connect with the universal energy that is the God force and will send the objects of your desire into your immediate world. This must be done in accordance with all nine of the principles of manifesting that are explained in this tape, which means you have an absence of doubt, complete trust, unconditional love, and a knowing that this power of attraction is within you and in all things. Gradually you will begin to experience an overwhelming sense of bliss and peace. For the next approximately one-third of the morning meditation, say the ah sound softer and softer. Stay focused on the third eye, which is now open and sending out this creation energy and the feeling of your desire manifesting. For the final third of your morning meditation, repeat the sound of ah to yourself silently as a mantra, and keep your attention on the third eye and the glorious feeling of gratitude that you are already experiencing for having this manifest into your life. When you have completed approximately 20 to 30 minutes of this manifesting meditation, your morning session will be complete. Some people have used this meditation to manifest peace for themselves or those they love, to center themselves on a healing, or to bring a relationship into their life. Others have used it for such matters as selling a house, getting a promotion, overcoming an addiction, attracting money, or whatever. The possibilities are unlimited. What you are doing when you do this morning ah meditation is resonating with the words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The act of manifesting is the beginning of something being created in your life. The evening meditation is best practiced at sunset if possible. Once again, as the sun sinks below the horizon, there is a corona-like expression of energy that is greatest just as the sun leaves the horizon and for a few moments immediately after. Now you practice the sound of Om, which is the meditation of gratitude. The practice is identical to the morning meditation with the exception that now you are not asking to manifest anything. Instead, at the end of your daylight or as you retire, you are simply saying thank you to the universal intelligence that we call God for all that has manifested in your life. Take in deep breaths just as you did in the morning. Clear the channel between your base chakra and your third eye chakra and mentally picture all that you have received and project that energy out forcefully through the opening of the third eye. You are expelling into the universe beyond your immediate body and energy of gratitude. The sound of Om is said aloud for the first third of your meditation, then gradually, more quietly, and ultimately silently, always focusing grateful attention on the third eye and feeling that energy going back to the universal source of energy that we call God. The final part of this meditation is the last sound you hear before you go to sleep each night. The very first sound you hear in the morning is generally one of Ah. It is the sound that you make when you yawn or stretch. However, the final sound you hear within yourself before going to sleep can be a combination of these two sounds of Ah and Om. I defined enlightenment earlier as the ability to be immersed in and surrounded by peace. It is not an accident that the sounds Ah and Om, when combined, translate to the word that means peace 
or enlightenment. Shalom. Shalom. By saying these two sounds to yourself as you drift off to sleep, you are becoming at one with all that is peaceful and all that provides for us. It is also not an accident that the primary sound of spiritual joy is the sound of Ah in Alleluia. And it is also a sound in the last word of every prayer. Amen. Give this glorious, peaceful, enlightening manifestation meditation practice a three-month trial using each of the nine principles outlined in this book and see if you do not experience your heart's desire appearing. Alleluia. Shalom. The eighth principle for spiritual manifesting simply says, patiently detach from the outcome. In the seventh principle on the use of sound meditation, I emphasize the importance of placing your attention on your feelings as you picture your desire manifesting. This eighth principle of spiritual manifesting has at its heart the experience of that feeling. The manner of how and when it is desired shows up is something that you must not try to control. Manifesting is not about making demands of God in the universe. Manifesting is a cooperative venture in which your intention is aligned with divine intelligence. That intelligence is in all things and in you simultaneously. Demanding that God send your desire according to your timetable and design reinforces the incorrect idea of God as a separate energy. There's an important concept to try to grasp here. It's called intelligence apart from individuality. Most of us believe that the recognition of any other individual affirms a point at which our own individuality ceases and the other's begins. This belief is part of our conditioning, and it imposes a great deal of limitation on us. If this pattern were ascribed to the universal mind, it would describe a God that at some point ceased and something else began. To be universal and to recognize anything as being outside itself would be to deny its very being. So the nature of universal intelligence is an absence of individual personality. You are in an impersonal and intensely intelligent ocean of life that is all around, under, and in everything, including you. Though you have been conditioned to believe that you are an individual, you are actually a part of the grand universal nature that is infinite in its possibilities. This undifferentiated intelligence responds to you when you recognize it. Ask yourself what the relationship of this universal mind is to you. It cannot have favorites if it is the root and support for everything and everyone. Lacking individuality, it cannot be in conflict with your desires. Being universal, it cannot be simply shut off from you. All these statements characterize this all-producing mind as responsive to you when you understand your relationship to it. Your task is to bring the universal energy within your grasp by raising yourself to the level of that which is universal, rather than bring the universal down to a level of misperceived individuality that is separate from the universal. You need only to recognize it to attract it to yourself, rather than ask it to recognize you and bring you to it. Having learned a different set of principles, all of this may sound a bit confusing, yet it is crucially important for you to know this before moving along on the path of manifesting. There's a power of infinite patience. This provocative line is from A Course in Miracles. Those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait and without anxiety. The notions of certainty and patience go together. When you trust and know that you are connected to that universal all-providing intelligence, then you simply place no time constraints on your manifestation. Your knowing and your infinite patience put you at ease. Your inner sense is that what you want to manifest is already here and your inner attention is on the feeling of well-being that you are already blessed with what you seek. The inner bliss is a function of the power of your infinite patience. When you are certain about the outcome and unconcerned with the how and when, you have cultivated the power of infinite patience and simultaneously you have detached yourself from the outcome. When this detachment takes place, you are able to go about your daily business of raising your children, doing your work or training, meditating and communing with God, and just patiently observing. Infinite patience is a sign of trust, and it calls upon infinite love to produce results in your life. When you let go of impatience, you are aligned with the God force, and the anxiety that tells you what is lacking and missing in your life is gone. 
You will know that God has been patient with you no matter how long it took you to come around, regardless of how far you may have wandered and no matter how much you may have refused to listen. Infinite patience produces almost immediate results in your life. You become free when you relax your insistence to have it now. As an infinitely patient person, you know that you are already where you want to be, and there are no accidents, and that all that appears to be missing is nothing more than an illusion perpetrated by your ego. With this awareness, impatience leaves, and you stop looking for results of your manifesting meditation. Your patience allows you to remain in silent appreciation of all that is manifested in your life. This practice of patient detachment from outcome is a foreign concept to us. We have been taught that goals, success symbols, and the accumulation of merit badges are the ways to feel important. What follows is a guide for living with the seeming paradox of attempting to manifest something into your life and at the same time not being attached to when and how it shows up. So here's a step-by-step -step plan for putting patient detachment into your manifesting practice. First, understand the essence of what you desire. What you desire is not necessarily in the realm of things. If you want to manifest money, for example, notice if your attention is centered on the dollars or on the experience and feeling of financial security. The experience is the essence of your desire. By putting your attention on inner feelings, you shift from being gratified by externals. The essence of your desire is a feeling of well-being and joy and an alignment with the universal spirit. You may feel that you truly want to manifest more income and a promotion. Detach yourself from the in-the-world promotion and increase in pay. Put your manifesting energy on the essence. You are wanting to feel more secure and less stress. You will probably begin to see things arriving in your life that reduce your anxiety. They may seem to have very little to do with what you originally thought you wanted. And then secondly, banish doubt and enter into the realm of certainty. When you have removed doubt about your ability to manifest, it will be easy to detach yourself from the outcomes and all of the details. Your trust in yourself and in the divine energy of the universe is all you will need. Then third, leave your expectations and go about your business. Maintain your work and play regime with a new sense of peace originating in your inner knowing about what is manifesting for you. Remain completely detached from the inclination to measure and calculate what is and is not showing up for you. And then fourth in this step-by-step -step plan, maintain privacy about your desires. Sharing your manifestation efforts decreases the energy and deflects the energy into the ego's need to gain approval. Then fifth, be aware of the cues that your desires are manifesting. Keep in mind that the way things will show up in your life is not necessarily related to what your rational brain expects. Things may begin popping up into your life that were never there before and which may surprise you as you notice them more and more frequently. These synchronistic events and happenings are the result of beginning to live in a heightened state of awareness. Pay close attention to the cues as they serve us and gently tell yourself, it's working, I can see the results. And then sixth, act immediately on the cues that arrive by acknowledging them. When you acknowledge the early signs of arrival of what you wish to manifest, you are giving your inner energy a positive charge in recognizing the divine universal intelligence. This recognition is essential to the continuation of this manifesting process. And seventh, don't think of your manifestation as a special favor. To see manifestation as a favor is to begin the process of bargaining with God and believing in your separateness from all other living things. Your desires manifest because you are in perfect alignment with your source of creation and because you are not placing any limitations on what can come into your life. And then eighth, view any and all obstacles as lessons, not indications of failure. Keep in mind that you are practicing patience and detachment from outcome. Everything that shows up in your life is supposed to. This includes the falls in your life. They provide you with the energy to propel yourself to a higher state of awareness. And then ninth, release all judgment from your manifesting practice. This requires you to be willing to suspend your inclination to judge that which shows up in your life as right or wrong, good or bad, attractive or unattractive. Your judgments halt the flow of universal energy into your life and put you at odds with that divine power. Your ability to manifest depends in large part on your willingness to leave behind the collective judgments that make up the totality of human beliefs. Detaching from these beliefs is one of the greatest challenges of your life. You will probably experience a sense of loss and perhaps a feeling of loneliness as you make this step out of judgment. The reward is that you will begin to expand your own perceptions and accept what others believe are their perceptions. 
a business card you might find walking on the beach, a book or a tape recording, a message intended for another but is in your mailbox. All these can be cues. Send away all judgments about how anything arrives in your life and refuse to assume the collective judgments that permeate the beliefs of most of the people you encounter. As you notice what arrives and disappears, try to do it with a feeling of total acceptance. In your inner world now, anything you can imagine is actually a part of you. Your proclamation of being wealthy and happy, if taken to that inner non-judgmental world, will lead you to feel wealthy and happy. This in turn will lead you to begin acting in new ways. You will begin to create a new concrete reality of wealth and happiness within yourself as you generate a positive attitude toward all you encounter. No judgments, simply maintaining an inner feeling of having already manifested whatever it is you desire. Your mind will attempt to use logic, but manifestation is not logical. Your mind will try to employ negativity, insisting that you are too old, too stupid, or too undeserving, that you never win anything, that you've wished for things in the past and been disappointed and there's no reason to expect things to change now. This is the attachment of the mind and the ego to results in past history. Meditation and intuitive feelings are two ways to supersede the mind. The emphasis is on detaching from the collective unconscious beliefs, refusing to judge, and patiently allowing the universal source to deliver what you are now totally aligned with in your inner world. And tenth, learn to relax in peace and knowing. The universal intelligence works at its own perfect pace. It will deliver when you are in alignment with the nine principles detailed in this tape. The delivery is guaranteed by the absence of doubt that you cultivate and total trust in the presence of this energy in all things, including that which you are going to attract into your life. And finally, on eleventh, Use affirmations to keep the energy flowing and to detach from the outcome. The most useful affirmation I can provide in this regard is really quite simple. I am infinite and universal, and I trust in the divine power of the universe, which is also within me. This then concludes the eighth principle for spiritual manifestation. This eighth principle revolves around transcending your mind and the collective mind that has been with you since your conception. It asks you to be patient when your mind will demand results. Once you perfect that infinite patience, you will demonstrate your trust in something other than your own limited body-mind, and you will peacefully allow your desires to manifest in their own good way, in their own good time. Our ninth and final principle of spiritual manifestation is called simply reacting to your manifestations with gratitude and generosity. The conscious expression of gratitude and generosity is the final principle in this miraculous process of spiritual manifestation. Experiencing an inner sense of gratitude and generosity is the result of being in harmony with all the other eight principles discussed in this book. Gratitude is your expression of acknowledging the oneness of the universal energy working in cooperation with your desires. Let's look at the nature of gratitude. Gratitude is the complete and full response of the human heart to everything in the universe. It is the absence of feeling alienated or separate. It represents our full acknowledgement and appreciation of the energy flowing through all things and brings gifts to us in the form of the fulfillment of our desires. Gratitude recognizes that nothing is to be taken for granted and, most important, it is an expression of complete unconditional love in the form of a thank you to the God force that is in all things. It is a way of being one with the God Force in full inner serenity. It recognizes that the spirit within ourselves is the same as that which sustains all life on the planet. Gratitude then represents the whole of ourselves. When we feel grateful and give thanks, sending out this kind of loving energy to the world in the same fashion that we did when we were asking for our heart's desire to be manifested, we feel complete. Gratitude allows us to feel more connected to that for which we are grateful. Gratitude acknowledges that we are the recipients of the generosity of others, of life, and of the universal spirit. Gratitude contributes a loving response to the whole of creation and to your relationships with creation. That relationship illustrates for us how interconnected and interdependent everything is, including the manifestations in our lives. When we understand the nature of gratitude, we can more clearly identify those things within ourselves that are obstacles to practicing gratitude. Gratitude is an inner process. It is an attitude of thankfulness, even when things do not appear as we would prefer. Rumi once wrote, Don't grieve for what doesn't come. Some things that don't happen keep disasters from happening. Gratitude is a way of experiencing the world with love rather than judgment. 
The three most common obstacles to an attitude of gratitude originate in your mental processes. The first is simply called fault-finding. You always have the choice to be love-finding or fault-finding. The fault-finder focuses on what is wrong and what is missing. That focus shows up as criticism, judgment, and anger. The feeling is of being against the manifestations that appear in the world, rather than being for what one receives. As we think, so shall we be. If you are using your mind to think about what is wrong and what is lacking, this is precisely what will manifest for you. Finding fault, rather than being grateful and being a love finder, guarantees that you will not be able to participate in the co-creation of your life and the fulfillment of your desires. A second obstacle to an attitude of gratitude is called simply complaining. The complainer always feels short-changed and deprived and consequently becomes envious and bitter toward those who seem to have been blessed with what is missing in his or her own life. The inner experience of complaining leads to being angry at the universal source that seems to have denied you the benefit of its infinite supply. Complaining is an expression of the absence of love in your inner world. When you feel love, there's no room for being upset with God for not delivering your ego's demands. And the third obstacle to an attitude of gratitude is taking what you have for granted. Taking things and people in your life for granted drains you of the joy that you could be experiencing. Taking things for granted means going through life unaware of the multitude of gifts that are here in each and every moment. Think of the activities and experiences that would be missed if they suddenly disappeared. Remind yourself that there are no ordinary moments. Kicking a ball around with a child, watching the shape of the clouds in the early morning, or hearing the sounds of the seasons saying good night to a loved one. Every single experience is an opportunity to experience gratitude or its opposite, ennui. It is also a choice. Strive to be alert to being a love finder. Sleepwalking through life is a choice to impede the gratitude that is necessary for you to become a manifester. If you take everything for granted, you will never be able to see the clues that will give you the impetus to take action on your desired manifestation. The appearance of the right person or the unexpected gift will be greeted with a shrug and a disinterest, which will prevent you from receiving its blessings. Be awake and fully appreciative of everything and everyone. And here appreciation and depreciation need to be understood. When we depreciate something, we devalue or diminish its worth. We depreciate things or people by expressing disapproval or dislike. It is impossible to feel grateful for something or someone we do not value. Begin to see things and people as they truly are. Each person is a child of God. See the unfolding of God in each person you meet. The moment you participate in the depreciation process, you block your ability to experience gratitude, and consequently, you obstruct your ability to manifest prosperity, love, and joy into your life. Essentially, the activity of depreciation means that you are not sensing the beauty of life. Become an appreciator, and therefore a manifester, by seeing the Christ shining back at you in the other person or groups of people. Cultivating an attitude of gratitude is something we all want to work on in this manifesting process. Make the shift to being grateful for all that you are and all that you have, and you will facilitate your ability to manifest into your life the essence of all that you desire. Develop an awareness of yourself as a recipient rather than as a victim. Virtually everything you possess in your life is because of the efforts of others. Your furniture, automobile, home, clothes, gardens, yes, even your own body are all in some way gifts from others. Without the efforts of thousands and thousands of people all working in harmony, you would have nothing showing up in your life. Just remind yourself of this fact each day, and gratitude will begin replacing cynicism. Also, practice a silent expression of gratitude when you start to see your desires manifesting from the universal source. Thank you, God. I see you working in my life, and I acknowledge with love my appreciation for all that you bring to me. Also, become a person who is willing to tell those around you how much you appreciate them. Make a concerted effort to say aloud how much you love your family members without making it a phony ritual. The more you are willing to express gratitude, the more you are cultivating an experience of unconditional love, which, as you know, is the secret to manifesting. Be thankful and avoid complaining as much as possible. Catch yourself as you are about to find fault with someone or some condition. Then, instead, find something to say that reflects a willingness to be a love finder. Give yourself a specific period of time to practice avoiding complaining and fault finding, perhaps 30 days. You will experience the emptying of rancor and complaints from your inner self and the opening to love, appreciation, and gratitude. Begin each and every day with an expression of gratitude and thanksgiving. Every morning when you awake, you have been given the gift of a sunrise and 24 hours to live. 
Take in a deep breath and be grateful for this exhilarating experience of breathing in life and love. End your day with an expression of love and a repetition of the word for peace, Shalom. Be aware of the need to be grateful for the suffering and struggles that are part of the fabric of your life. Sometimes it's easy to simply be angry at your suffering rather than to know that it is the catalyst for your searching and awakening. And also remember, it is the nature of thought to increase. The more your thoughts are centered on what is missing, the more deficient you feel and the more complaints you will utter. Similarly, the more you practice gratitude, the more you are thankful and appreciative of all that life provides, and the more you feed your experience of abundance and love. And now a look at generosity and service, the final steps in manifesting. The natural extension of being grateful is the development of a generous heart. Perfect generosity is a willingness to give of yourself and all that you have manifested without any expectation of a return. Manifesting is about connecting to the universal spirit which is infinite and abundant in supply. Manifesting is not about seeing neediness in yourself, but is rather about feeling complete with that radiant abundance. It is concerned with unconditional love and attracting that abundant love to your individual life. When you feel the presence of that abundance, your feeling of gratitude will push you in the direction of generosity. It is in the expression of your generosity that you will feel most connected to the unconditional love of the universal spirit. The more you feel a desire to share what you receive unconditionally, the more you will experience it flowing into your life. Generosity and self-liberation go together. Generosity is helpful for your own liberation in that it teaches you about the inner quality of letting go. Letting go and releasing your attachments are the most freeing things you can do to liberate yourself from the ego. A need to hang on to things and money you receive arises out of an inner sense of incompleteness. Practicing generosity aligns you with your sense of completeness and love. Generosity extends to more than simply sharing your material possessions. Generosity includes offering kindness, care, love, and nurturing. Furthermore, the spirit of generosity can and does ultimately relate to how we treat ourselves. If you have a generous heart that has no qualms about giving, you will treat yourself lovingly and will nurture yourself without feeling any sense of guilt. Thus, giving and receiving are really the way the universe works. Every single time that you take in a breath and then exhale, you are engaged in a process of giving and receiving that is vital to the material and spiritual world. With each inhalation, you take in the oxygen and nitrogen you must have to exist. And with each exhalation, you send back the carbon dioxide that supplies the entire plant world. The cycle of generous giving and receiving is exactly the same as the very act of breathing. Look around you and notice how everything in our universe is a result of giving and receiving. The entire food chain represents a giving of life and a taking of life, and then a giving back and an endless cycle of material manifestation. The process works in the same way on the spiritual level. You put out loving energy to connect to that which you desire, and it returns to you. It is a giving and receiving action. So therefore, it's really important to cultivate an attitude of generosity. Put generosity into your manifestation practice to keep the natural flow of giving and receiving moving in your life. Recognize that this is a way of being that can be developed. You may have convinced yourself that giving is impossible because you have too little for yourself. If you're not generous when it's difficult, you will not be generous when it is easy. Generosity is a function of the heart, not the wallet. A generous heart is one that places no limitations on its ability to be generous with others and does not do it for reward or recognition. Think of the myriad of things that you do each day for others, including animals and the environment, as ways of practicing generosity. Talking to a lonely neighbor, feeding a stray cat, opening a door, anonymously paying the toll for the car behind you, vacuuming the carpet, or whatever may occur in the thousands of actions you undertake each day. Most important, remember that to give without expectation of an acknowledgement is truly the work of your higher self. Keep your generosity practices private. Then become aware of the internal resistances that arise within you when you have an impulse to give. Your fear of not having enough for yourself and your family, your doubts about whether others are truly needy, the fact that others won't appreciate it anyway, are impulses that you need to honor as valid. All of these inner doubts and fears should be examined without judgment. And then give yourself designated times and periods of time to practice being generous, particularly in offering service or in giving of your time. Sometimes I notice my young son out playing soccer by himself, wishing in his heart he had someone to play with. I remind myself to forget about the zillion things I have to do, my state of fatigue or whatever, and I designate the next several hours to simply sharing my time with him, 
something we both love. Practice being able to receive. Accept help when others offer it. Allow others to do for you without feeling embarrassed or without feeling that your independence is threatened. If you turn off the receiving side, you cut the natural flow of energy, just as if you turned off the giving side. Receiving is very much a component of the spiritual practice of manifestation, and you can work at allowing this into your life with gratitude and love. Furthermore, practice giving just a bit more than you think you can, and a bit more than your own comfort level allows. Whatever you have convinced yourself is the limit of your generosity, try going beyond it. You also can practice a little bit more generosity with your own self than you are normally accustomed to. Order the item on the menu that costs more, or give yourself a few extra days on your vacation trip, or allow yourself the luxury of a body massage or a facial. Extend your generosity into service as a way of life. Our encounters and relationships are a central influence on ourselves and each other. Service is a word that is not commonly thought of as part of our ordinary relationships, yet service simply cannot be separated from relationships. When you cultivate an attitude of gratitude and generosity, you will find yourself wanting to be in the service of others. You will find it natural to extend that which you receive into the service of others as well. If you receive a great teaching, you will want to teach it to others. If you receive love, you will wish to extend that love unconditionally outward. Your relationships will automatically be felt as gifts for the service of others. When you contemplate the purpose of your life in the material plane, you will discover that the only thing you can do with your life is to give it away. You cannot lay claim to anything. It is all transitory. You will find your purpose and your strength when you see that you are in a relationship with all other living things and that you are purposeful and peaceful when you serve in some capacity. It is out of this state of recognizing our fundamental interconnectedness that we realize we are all in a constant state of service to each other. It is this awareness that you want to keep uppermost in your mind as you generate this principle of spiritual manifesting. Service, at its very basic core, is an inner choice to offer a helpful and healing attitude to others as well as to ourselves. A natural outgrowth of feeling grateful for our daily life manifestations is experiencing the inclination to be generous. By turning the purpose of your life into one of service and leaving behind your self-absorption, you discover the irony of manifesting. The more you choose to be of service, the more profoundly you experience unconditional love, and the more you find materializing into your life. Service is best thought of as a continuous focus in your life rather than being limited to certain kinds of giving activities. Service is a state of mind that expresses love rather than fear, trust rather than distrust. It focuses on meeting all others as equals with whom we share a spiritual identity. This inner attitude of love reveals itself in action. Service does not require that you become a Mother Teresa. You serve by suspending your ego and extending the love that fills that space. It can take a million different forms, but when practiced with authenticity, from the heart, it makes all that is manifested into your life worthwhile. The only problem you will encounter is attempting to give or serve without love. The moment you put a condition on your service or ask something in return, you introduce conditional rather than unconditional love. The imposition of the condition makes service empty. Service without love is obligation, and it carries guilt and anger and resentment along with it. Work at being in a state of unconditional love with your service efforts, and when love is not authentically present, acknowledge that as well. This concludes the ninth principle of spiritual manifesting. Be willing to take all that is attracted to you as a result of your practicing the manifesting principles. Be willing to turn right around and in a spirit of gratitude and generosity, devote yourself to an act of service. The more you practice in this light, the more you will see the objects of your desire coming to fruition regularly. I want to close this final principle with another observation by Rumi, titled, The Servant Who Loved His Prayers. It sums up all that I have said, not only here in this final principle on gratitude, generosity, and service, but in this entire program. Listen to the words carefully, and as you end this tape and go to work on your own spiritual manifestation program, recall this passage by Rumi, born in the year 1207 in the Persian Empire in what is now called Afghanistan. It will remind you of your role in all of this a role that is limited only by the restrictions you place on your spiritual awareness. He titled this poem, The Servant Who Loved His Prayers. At dawn, a certain rich man wanted to go to the steam baths. He woke his servant, Sunquar. Ho, get moving, get the basin and the towels and the clay for washing, and let's go to the baths. Sunquar immediately collected what was needed, and they set out side by side along the road. 
As they passed the mosque, the call to prayer sounded. Sunkwar loved his five times prayer. Please, Master, rest on this bench for a while that I might recite Surah 98, which begins, You who treat your slave with kindness. The Master sat on the bench outside while Sunkwar went in. When prayers were over and the priest and all the worshippers had left, still Sunkwar remained inside. The Master waited and waited. Finally he yelled into the mosque, Sunkwar, why don't you come out? I can't. The clever one won't let me out. Have a little more patience. I hear you out there. Seven times the master waited and then shouted. Sunkwar's reply was always the same. Not yet. He won't let me come out yet. But there's no one in there but you. Everyone else has left. Who makes you sit still so long? The one who keeps me in here is the one who keeps you out there. The same who will not let you in will not let me out. The ocean will not allow its fish out of itself nor does it let land animals in where the subtle and delicate fish move. The land creatures lumber along on the ground. No cleverness can change this. There's only one opener for the lock of these matters. Forget your figuring. Forget yourself. Listen to your friend. When you become totally obedient to that one, you will be free. May you always swim in the ocean of abundance while manifesting your own divine destiny. Listen to your friend. I'd like to provide you with a summary of the nine principles. I would like you to have all nine principles in the same place so that you can refer to them often, as well as see how they comprise a step-by-step -step program for implementing a spiritual manifestation awareness for yourself. Each principle flows to the next, and if you apply them in this sequential manner, I can guarantee that you will begin to view yourself as an absolute miracle, an individual who is connected to the universal all-pervading spirit in such a firm manner that you know you are a co-creator of your own life and all that is attracted into it. The Nine Principles Number 1. Becoming Aware of Your Highest Self This awareness helps you to view yourself as more than merely a physical creation, which leads to the second principle. Trusting yourself is trusting the wisdom that created you. This principle establishes you as one and the same with the universal God Force, which leads you to the third principle. You are not an organism in an environment. You are an environ organism. This principle establishes that there is no separation between you and anything else outside you in the material world, which leads to the fourth principle, that you can attract to yourself what you desire. This principle establishes your power to attract that which you are already connected to, which leads to the fifth principle, honoring your worthiness to receive. This principle affirms that you are worthy of all that is attracted to your life, which leads to the sixth, connecting to the divine source with unconditional love. This principle creates an awareness of the significance of accepting your manifestations with absolute love, which leads to the seventh principle, meditating to the sound of creation. This principle gives you the tools for vibrating yourself to the very sounds that are in the world of creation. These are the tools for attracting and manifesting, which leads to the eighth principle, to patiently detach from the outcome. This principle emphasizes the need for removing demands and becoming infinitely patient, which leads to the final principle, to react to all of your manifestations with gratitude and generosity. This principle teaches the value of taming the ego and being thankful and in service to others with your manifestations. In essence, all that is being said here is, manifestation means when you are participating in the act of spiritual manifestation, you are doing nothing more than manifesting another aspect of yourself, since you are connected to everything and everything you wish for also shares that energy. God bless you. I send you love and all green lights.